Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The fear you can hear. No breath of it yet as we begin our tale and meet Stephen and Simon Fairley. The occasion is solemn, as death should be. But all else for these identical twins is a wild sense of freedom and expectation with no hint of the dark disasters already forming as they listen to the words of their father's last bequests. And that the whole of my estate shall be disposed of as follows. To Stephen Fairley, my firstborn son, I leave all my worldly goods in entirety. Well, thanks a hunk for nothing, dear old dad. Uh, there, there is a clause that refers to you, Simon. Then let's hear it. To my second-born, Simon, I leave only advice. Mend your ways. It is inconceivable to me and has been most of my life that you could be brother to Stephen, much less his identical twin. Now, that's enough, Mr. Holcomb. Well, there are some small bequests. Uh, no, we can take names. them up later. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, sir. Yeah, so am I, Stephen. I never expected the old crook to outfox me. I hope he rots in hell. That's a damnable thing to say. Precisely. Since this family long ago decided I'm the devil's own, why shouldn't I be his advocate? Or apostate? To hell with us all, Stephen. And may I be the last to join you. Our mystery drama, And Death Makes Even Stephen, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Tolan and Paul Hecht. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule, and New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It was true of the Fairley twins... Physically, no one could ever tell them apart. But their personalities, that was something else again. Stephen, the quiet, the considerate, the steady, the accountable. Simon, the wild, the unpredictable, the often cruel, the man of success in nothing. Except for physical resemblance, these two men from the same mother seemed the antithesis of each other. Aren't you going a bit heavy on that, Simon? Oh, just getting all I can, brother dear, while the getting is good. Now that I'm a pauper, I must make the most of every opportunity. Now don't be a fool. Here, give me that. Oh, such a waste. But then you can afford it. You've had enough today. Besides, I must talk to you. Oh, you mean there may be a chance that I'm not to be cast out and told never to darken the door again? Knock it off, Simon. I got to talk to you, seriously. And for Pete's sake, sit down. No, I think I prefer to face the coup de grace, standing back to the wall, unblindfolded and unafraid. Yeah, suit yourself, but quit clowning and stay away from the booze. Okay, okay, Stevie, forgive me. It was just Dad's will. I know he didn't exactly approve of me, but wow. <laughs> Finding out how much really threw me for a loop. That isn't as bad as it seems. There was a letter to me... He didn't want to leave you with nothing, Simon. And he's asked me to set up a trust to be administered by me to provide you with a decent income. Well, now I think I I will sit down. How much? The trust or the income? No, the money in the pocket, my one hour older brother. That's what I get while you're alive, right? Yes, a thousand a month, tax free. <laughs> 12,000 shimmering simoleons a year. <laughs> That's a generous bequest from a man who could have bought Rhode Island and still have had enough left over to cut the national debt in half. Well, what would you have expected him to do? What he should have done, considering who we are. What? Cut the estate right down the middle. Left us each a half. You know why he'd never have done that. Oh, yes, only too damn well. I was ten before I was old enough to latch on to the truth. Why, you were always the favorite. No, no, favorite isn't even the word. You know he always blamed me for mother's death. He hated me. That isn't true. Then why do the you... The shoe was somehow on the other foot. Your whole life, Si. 
Expelled from school after school, the girls, the car accidents, robberies, beating up women, all the things he had to cover yes, for Yes, to save the precious Fairley name. All the things I did to get his attention. To have him treat me like a human being instead of a murderer. Now you've been drinking too much. Oh, no, Stevie boy, this is Simon Cold Sober. Simple Simon, who couldn't have his only parent's love, so he didn't know any better thing to do than to reach out any way to get him to even notice We me. spent most of our lives in boarding schools. Do you think he offered me so much Yeah, more? only the whole ball of wax. I was talking of love. That's a word with no meaning in this house. Even between us. What do we really know about each other? Except as children, we've been separated most of the time. And I always managed to get the short end... <laughs> Who was drafted while you and Dad lived at home and you joined the business while I crawled on my belly with the VC trying to do what my father didn't have the nerve to do? Get rid of me. None of that was my fault. No. But Becky was something else again. You were missing in action. Reported killed. It was over two years, Si. I loved Becky, too, and she turned to me. Yeah, too bad I returned before the marriage had taken place. Still, in my condition then, it was hard to think of us as identical twins. Forty pounds difference in weight made quite a difference, huh? So she stuck with you, and you won, as always. Which brings us back to the immediate problem. Are you ready to cut the estate right down the middle and give me half? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. But you are the brother who is all love. The money isn't dollars and cents, Simon. It's the shipping business, the holding company, the import-export exchange, a hundred interlocking parts. All right, then buy me off. A million, a couple of million, <laughs> out of those nice, anonymous, numbered Swiss bank accounts. And then you can do what my father longed his whole life to do. Forget I ever existed. Or that I still do. No way. Now, in three to five years, you'd blow it all on women and every grifter who got next to you with his get-rich-quick scheme. No. Father was right. I may have found him hard to love. Oh, you worked hard enough to toady your way into his affections. Perhaps I was... Perhaps I was sorry for him. Now, who is to say which of us caused mother most harm, caused her to die in childbirth? Ah, past history. Oh, now there are only two of us. Now, come on, Cy, won't you accept Dad's suggestion and mourn him in some decency? Twelve thousand a year? I can't live on that. It's free and clear. You have the house to live in, food, no living expenses. All right, suppose... Suppose I accept. We'll make it all legal. The trust can revert to you, if you will, by your 35th birthday. And Becky? <sighs> She's already made her choice. But, but what? <sighs> well, since your unexpected return and father's death have delayed our marriage... Well, perhaps it's only fair. Look, there's no way I can prevent you seeing her again. And now that you're back to yourself physically, I suppose you ought to. You know our engagement party is a week from tomorrow, but she won't be back from New York till then. In spite of Father's death, we've decided not to call it off. You're invited. And if you think you can replace me as the prospective groom... <laughs> What can I do to prevent you? But as far as Becky is concerned, if you hurt her in any way, twin brother or not, I'll kill you. Well, now I must see about the funeral arrangements. Huh. Not you, dear brother. I. I'm the one with everything to gain. If only I knew the way. Why are you so late? Uh, would you believe a flat tire tonight of all nights? And, oh, and Becky, well, I'm... It, it, it doesn't matter now, now that you're here. But you've got to help me, darling. We're, we're going to have to make a decision. About what? Kiss me first. I don't need any invitation for that. <sighs> you, you've never kissed me like that before. There's never been an occasion quite like this. But... It looks as though it isn't going to be the occasion we planned it to be. What does that mean? It's father. You know how uptight he can get over nothing. Nobody better. I grew up with one of my own. I never heard you talk like that about your father before. Oh, I just... I just meant the generation gap. 
Well, maybe that that's what it is with Father. He's, he's just laid it out flat. No engagement tonight, no announcement, nothing. Then what's the party supposed to be for? It isn't even a party anymore. It's a sort of memorial service for his old friend. He said it would be an insult to Justin's memory to have gaiety and fun so soon after his funeral. But I want us to be engaged. I don't want to wait. Look, I have, I have an even better idea. What? Let's you and me slip out right now. Forget the engagement and get married. But uh, how? We have no license or... Look, we're less than 20 miles from a state where all we need is the fee and two witnesses. Oh, oh you, you really bowl me over, Stephen. And that's more the kind of thing Simon would do. Well, Simon was a bit of a whack, I guess. Simon was a lot worse than that. There are things I could tell you about your brother that... Well... That's past history. How is he now? The very picture of health. <laughs> it's unbelievable. When he got back from prison camp, I, I could hardly recognize him. He'd had a rough time. I know. And that's why I was so ashamed of myself for... For what? Don't... Don't tell this to anyone, Steve. But I... I always used to be so scared after... After Simon and I had broken off and it was you and me. Scared of what? Just hold me. Uh, you're, you're so uncannily alike. Even I, who know you both so well, was scared I, I might not be able to tell the difference. Oh, darling, what a terrible thing to have to say or even think. Don't think it. Put it out of your thoughts. I can't. It's eerie. It's terrifying to even consider I could ever mistake my kind, gentle, loving Stephen for that... Wild, brutal twin who would have destroyed us. Shh, darling. Don't look back. Kiss me, and then let's take off together. Oh, Steve, I can't. With, not with the guest Then kiss here. me. No, not, not with I the... Said, oh, kiss oh, me. Oh. Damn. You... You're not Stephen? Stephen would never... Stephen. I've been looking for you everywhere, Becky. Oh, I wish you'd found me sooner. What's going on here? Well, it, it doesn't matter now, now that you're here. Seeing you together, there's, there's no doubt, but a part of... What is it? Look, if that lousy no, brother of mine... Stephen, don't be silly. He, he was just congratulating me. It's a little enthusiastic for just an engagement, wasn't it? I haven't told you the news yet, Stephen. It isn't our engagement we're announcing tonight. What? It's our wedding, and as soon as possible, unless you object. No, of, of, of course not, but your father... Uh, you leave him to me. I'll arrange everything. You lead, I'll follow. When's the day? Just as fast as we can get the license. Like, day after tomorrow, or the one after that at the latest. <laughs> I wish you didn't have to go, Steve. We should have been the party tail enders. I gotta get Simon home. He's practically out cold. Yeah. Come on, Simon. Uh, Come on, get in. Yeah, no, no. The driver's seat. You're in no condition to drive. Well, you're a lousy driver. I'm better at the wheel than you, drunk or sober. Oh, would you get in the car? Uh, yeah. It's out cold. I hope someone's up to help lug him up to bed. Well, good night, darling. Good night. Drive carefully. There's a fog coming up. Yeah, I will. Goodbye, my, uh, my almost wife. <laughs> Goodbye, my almost husband. I'll show them all. What? Yeah, I'll have her if I want. I'll take everything if I want. You can't do it to me. Well, just shut up, Simon, will you? Just go back to sleep. Huh? Hey, the VC got a roadblock, Lieutenant. Huh? Yeah, I feel it in my bones right around the next bend. To so stop the convoy. I want to stop the... Oh! Steve. Where, where are we? It's all right, all right. Take it easy, Simon. We're just on the way home. Huh? How come I'm not driving? Because you passed out. Well, the... The road? Where's the road? We're, we're off the road. Cut it out, you fool. It's just far. No, no. Off the road. Back, what? back to the left. Look what you like. You're going to get back to the left. You're going to go left. You're going to go left. We're going right into the ditch. You're going to let go. The train. <laughs> After.
after the protesting scream of rubber, the quiet in the forest is a stillness so thick it could almost be touched. A rabbit stands frozen before flight. The birds perch on the limbs, heads cocked, as if waiting to decide which direction danger will come from. The only thing moving now is one of the twins, climbing from the twisted wreck. But which one? I'll return shortly with Act Two. The birds have risen and are off in a whir of wings. The rabbit has long since reached the safety of his warren before Simon Fairley has determined that the blood dripping in his eyes is from a minor gash in the forehead. And the rest of his aches and pains are just contusions and bruises. Only now does he go to look at his brother, pinned between the steering wheel and the seat cushion. Steve? Steve, are you all right? You're not dead. You can't be. Dead. It would solve everything. It would all be mine and no blame for me. He was driving. Steve. Steve, can you hear me? Uh, Damn, it's so difficult to get at your heart to hear. I can't feel any pulse. Dead. No more second-class citizen. I'd be number one at last. The house, the money, even... No. No, not Becky. She's beyond me. Unless... I could get away with it. I already did before I got careless and Steve turned up. Yes, that's it. That's the way. Make an exchange. Just get Steve out of his seat into mine. The wheel hasn't got him pinned too tight. No. There, he's coming loose. That's it. It's going to work. It's all going to be mine. Oh. What? What happened? Steve, you're... Uh, you're alive. Yeah, I guess so. How are you? Hey, you're bleeding. Huh? Oh, I just... I, I just cut my head a little. It's it's nothing. Uh, oh, I can't get up. I think I sprained my ankle. Maybe broken it. Here, give me a hand, Si. Uh, some sort of jagged rock under my back. Could you move it or, 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 or help me up? Yeah, now, let me see. Oh, it's just it's just a rock. Let me get rid of it and then... Get rid of it? Or use it? What are you waiting for? I, uh... I'm not waiting any longer. Well, then, for the love of... <laughs> this time... You are dead, but not Stephen. Simon. No time to wait around. There's plenty to do before someone finds you. Go around and break the windshield. No, no, not not from the outside. The inside. Now, get Steve into my seat and get into the driver's seat till someone finds me. Fellas, just finish up with the pitches and then get those two guys free. Okay. Now, don't try to move them. No. The ambulance will be here any moment. It, okay, we're just we can, uh, can back down there. Okay, miss, nothing for you. Move along. Oh, oh Sergeant, please. Okay. You, you've got to let me get through to Stephen. Stephen who? Stephen Fairley. I, I heard about the accident. You know Stephen Fairley? We're going to be married next week. Okay, cut your motor. Come on out. Now, uh, look, Miss... Uh... Uh, Elizabeth Rundell. Oh, sure. I thought I recognized you. Uh... Well, what is it, Sergeant? Can't you take me to the car? He's not badly hurt. He... Look, uh... look, Miss Rundell. You happen to know who was driving the car? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. It, it was Stephen. You sure of that? Quite. They'd only just left a, an engagement party at my house, and Simon had had too much to drink, so Stephen took the wheel. They look so like each other, I can't blame you for not being... They able... don't look 
nothing like each other now, lady. Well, they're not... Stephen isn't dead. The passenger is dead. The driver is alive. Oh. That's your guy. Well, how bad off he is, we won't know till we get him to the hospital. Nurse? No, Steve. It's, it's me. It's Becky. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Do you want the nurse? No, no, it's, it's just this bandage. It's, it's half over my eyes. <laughs> You'll be able to tell me from Simon from now on easily with this scar I've got over my eyes. Haven't they... Haven't they told you about Simon yet? What do you mean, told me? He wasn't... He... Oh, my God, no. Now I remember I was... I was half out when they found me, but I... His head must have gone right through the windshield. Is, is he dead? Yes. Oh, that poor, foolish kid. It's all my fault. I should have put the seatbelt oh, on him. Oh, darling, don't blame yourself. Just tell me what happened. It was the damn fog and Simon's drinking. I, I was taking it quite easy, but you know that big hollow on Hillsdale Road shortly after Gray's Corners? Mm-hmm. Well, just... Just as we hit that, the fog was like a smoke screen. And at the same time, Simon woke up from some drunken dream about Vietnam and went crazy. He grabbed the steering wheel and threw us right off the road and into the tree before I had a chance to break. The wheel and the seatbelt saved me. Although I did take a pretty good crack across the forehead, but Simon... Well, forget about that now, dear. It, it's over and done with. Just let's get you well. Oh, I'm, I'm fine, Becky. I've gotten a clean bill of health. Nothing broken, just a few bruises and a little embroidery above my eyes. You think you can manage a slightly piebald groom with a bandage headband? Oh, now look, Steve. We, we can't have the wedding as we planned it now. Why not? Well, how would it look? I don't care how it looks. It was my father and brother, and there was little love lost among us. I can tell you the truth now, dear. But I... I thought you and your father... My father was a hard man. Selfish, domineering, insensitive. He was more like a machine than a man. He was proud of me not because I was his son, but because I was his heir. Something to perpetuate the fairly name. Some sort of pseudo-immortality. Well, I'll make it up. I'll make it up to you. The past, Steve. Our future will be a long and lovely one. <laughs> With no twins... Well, I can't promise that. Well, they, they skip generations. Now, look, you you run along and plan something lovely to wear for tonight. Tonight? Yes, darling. I've already arranged the whole thing with Cook and Butler. You and I are having our engagement dinner alone at the house tonight. I'll send Gray with the car to pick you up at 7.30. <laughs> Please forgive me for troubling you with uh, uh, affairs of state, so to speak, the very day you're out of the hospital. That's all right, Mr. Holcomb, but I am a little short of time. Yes, of course, by all means. Now, what I need is a number of signatures from you. Signatures? No, just some legal papers and certain uh, certified checks which can't wait. <laughs> Damn. Well, look, you'll, you'll have to give me a day or so until they can take the bandage off this right hand of mine. I... I can't sign anything until they do. Oh, my apologies. Of course, I hadn't realized. Of course, everything can be delayed. <laughs> Except for one thing. What? Well, there's a piece of correspondence I don't quite understand. Apparently, some sort of a private deal between you and uh, Pesson, Joglu and company. Who? Uh, Pezen Joglu and Company, a Turkish import-export firm with whom we have some dealings. You know, Persian rugs, tabarets, ancient jewelry, inlaid cabinets, silk screens. Object are of many descriptions. Yes. But I don't know what consignment this letter, opened by mistake after your father's death, refers to. Uh, well, damn this forehead bandage. You, uh, read it to me. Oh, yes, very well. <coughs> <coughs> oh, omitting the formal address. It reads, um, 
Dear Stephanos, we are still awaiting payment consignment YB382-7. We are informed that delivery has been received. Unless your check for $48,000 or equivalent uh, reaches us within the week, we will be forced to take action against you. We know this must only be an oversight. Your sincerely, Demetrius uh, Pesson, uh, uh, Joe. Well, why don't you just pay it? Oh, Mr. Ferry, no one else in the company knows anything about this consignment, except you. Me? Oh, well, of course. Look, it, it's a perfectly normal deal. Just just pay him the money. Oh, a check that size would have to be countersigned by you, sir. And with your hand well, in the Well, by condition... tomorrow, I may be able to manage. Have we, have we time? Oh, well, according to the letter, to the end of the week or beginning of next. I don't think it's that important. All the puzzles me is the nature of such a, an expensive secret and, uh, <laughs> shall we say, a, a personal consignment. I don't think I have to account to you for that. Oh, not to me, but eventually when the books are... If you it, must know, it was a wedding present for my wife. Wife-to-be, that is. It, uh, it was my father's idea. A, a necklace. Apparently he got sick before he issued the check. Is there any reason why I can't close this matter? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Everything is yours now, Stephen, eh? <laughs> well, now, I, I mustn't delay you. You'll, you uh, will be postponing the wedding this Saturday, I suppose. No. Well, but there's scarcely time for your brother's funeral. It was Simon's you? desire to be cremated. It's already been done. There will be no funeral. Ah, I see. Perhaps you're right, Stephen. There's been enough sorrow for you in the past few days. You have a right to some happiness. Uh, that briefcase is very heavy. I'll carry it to your car for you. Well, perhaps it's better I leave it here. Then you can sign at your leisure. Good idea. And now, uh... Oh, yes. Now, of course, I must be off. Well, I expect you'll be taking a honeymoon, you and Becky... <laughs> so we won't be seeing you at the office for quite a while. No, not for quite a while. <laughs> uh, here you are, Mr. Holcomb. Let me help you in. Ah, uh, thank you. <laughs> now, call me as soon as you're ready with those signatures. The signature. I've got to get up to Steve's room and start learning to copy it. And what the... Devil is that business with the thing. I've got to get away from here fast. There are too many things I don't know about Steve. Everything's working too well to make any mistakes now. I uh, guess I have time to go through Steve's desk before I have to get dressed. Damn, it's locked. Naturally, Simon. Among your other unpleasant characteristics, you've always been a sneaky little snoop. Steve! Not exactly in the flesh, of course, thanks to you, but Steve, just the same. We're something rather special, you and I. <laughs> Even though you've somewhat altered my appearance, I am still your twin. Only the mouth and the chin, and the hair, matted now with dried blood, would serve to identify Steve. The rest of the face is a horror of torn flesh and the white shards of shattered bone, out of which wreckage stares the one uninjured eye, boring with deadly intensity into the terrified face of the man who was once his image. I'll return shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. Fascinated by that single hypnotizing eye, Simon is forced, for what seems an eternity, to focus on his twin's ruined face. The mocking smile and the white, even teeth. A ghastly contrast which multiplies the horror of the broken skull above them. At last, with a supreme effort, he tears his eyes away to find himself staring at the reflection of his own countenance in the mirror above the desk. No. Oh, God, no. Don't cover your face, little brother. Leave me at least with a memory of how I once looked. You're dead. 
cremated. You can't be here. As I said, not in the flesh, but uh, we are hatched from the same egg, Simon. You can't get rid of me so easily. I shall always be with you uh, in spirit, shall we say? No. No, leave me alone. I will. When it serves me. Or you. Steve, I... I didn't... I didn't mean to... Of course you did. I might possibly have done the same if our positions had been reversed. What? You have a lot to learn about me, little brother. Which you would have in time. <laughs> to avoid breaking open my desk, let me offer you the key. Steve, I... I, I can't rummage through your things now. The key? Take it. Why not? And since time is short before the dinner, I'll even help you understand a little better. Open the desk. Yeah. Left-hand pigeonholes are a false front. No, no, here. Let me. There are all my secrets. Now, while you read them, I'll tell you about the most important items. But... Why, why are you helping me? Because I want you quite as thoroughly damned as I am. I'll make it brief, as you read. Now, Demetrios is in the drug business. For years, I have used Father's impeccably accredited import firm to cover for deliveries. You... you in drugs? You'll find the evidence in the papers you're leafing through. <laughs> Wicked Simon, the black sheep. Stupid Simon, really. We were twins in more than the outward look, believe me. The difference was that you didn't have enough sense to bury your faults. I was smart enough to keep them covered up. But not smart enough to realize you had as little scruples as I had when it came to the point. All right, so you lost. Why not let me have my innings now? Why not? I'll even be of help. Until you have studied my signature enough to mask it, I'll even sign your papers for you. <laughs> oh, don't worry. The hand that guides the pen may be of the spirit world, but the pen and ink are finite enough. Go on. Get ready for romance. This... This letter that came from your Demetrius, shall I... Shall I pay this? Oh, uh, let me see. Oh, that double-dealing crook. No, I don't pay him a cent. I've already made arrangements so that he will be paid in full. Yeah, forget it. And you? <laughs> I will not be so easy to forget, dear twin brother. We are bound together by special hoops of steel. As long as I haunt this house, I shall be unavoidably hard to escape. Well, go on. It's time for you to be all that Becky expects of me. Of you. Aren't I what you hope to become? It's really too hot for a fire, but I, I couldn't resist it. I'd find it irresistibly romantic, even if I were bathed in sweat, which I'm not. <laughs> can, I, can I make you another drink? No, oh, thank you. I want to enjoy this dinner and remember it. The champagne. I'd be disappointed if there weren't. I don't want ever to disappoint you, darling. Oh, my darling Steve. Not you, ever. Ah. I'll try to live up to your expectations. Do you love me? I love you. I've always loved you. Now that I came so close to losing you, I love you even more. Well, it's a terrible thing to say, I know, but... Thank God it was Simon instead of you. Shh, darling, let's not spoil the evening. I've sent all the servants out, you know. We're all alone. You sure you don't want another drink? No. But can I make a confession? Of course. I'm famished. <laughs> Mademoiselle et Selby. <laughs> May I escort you to your table? Thank you, monsieur. Oh, Stephen... How pretty the table is. My favorite roses. But why... Why what, Becky? Why is it set for... for three? You don't mind my joining you, Simon, do you? Suitably dressed, white tie and tails, and uh, the face mask I thought was a stroke of genius. It hides the damage so nicely. 
Did you say something, Stephen? That damn Joseph, he's in his dotage. I suppose he's so accustomed to setting for three that he just... Don't blame the poor butler. I set the third place. Damn you, I won't have it. There's only... Uh... Steve! Steve, what is it? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Becky. I, I can't help it. It's all spoiled now. Let, let's get out of here and eat somewhere else. I've got to get away from this house. seem foolish to you, but that extra chair set for our dinner, it, it threw me. Well, it was unfortunate, I know, and you wanted everything to be just right. But don't blame poor old Joseph too much. After all these years of setting the table for you and your father... And, and... Steve... Simon. That's what did it to me, see? I could, I could see him sitting in that chair with his face... You didn't see him after the accident, thank God, but he... Steve, it wasn't your fault. He was the one who grabbed the wheel and pulled you off the road into the tree, wasn't he? Simon. Yes, Simon was, was the one, all right. That's, that's true enough. So you mustn't take the blame. As long as I live in that house, he'll haunt it. The memory of him, the battered face... Well, we'll solve all that. You won't live in the house... You'll move out to a hotel tonight, and after we're married on Saturday, when we come home from the honeymoon, we'll buy a new house. Hey, wait. I I have an even better idea. Maybe we'll never come back. Never? Maybe we'll, we'll settle in, in Rome or Paris or the Costa del Sol. Or, or just travel. I've always wanted to see Mont Saint-Michel and the Tivoli and Taj Mahal. That's my girl. That, that's what we'll do. Free souls with never a look behind. Becky, Becky, we've got it made, you and me, from here on in. Up for the honeymoon, huh? Hmm? Oh, oh, God, you again. Always, always, my dear twin, we're prisoners in the same jail. What does that mean? This house. Oh, I know you think you're escaping it for a while, but that's only temporary. Take it from me. Becky and I are off for a honeymoon. Of course. Not till Saturday, though. Does seem a little early to be packing. Might as well start sometime. And you seem to be planning to take quite a wardrobe. Well, on a ship, there's plenty of room. Plenty of distance between here and there. What do you mean, there? Oh, wherever. What were they, Rome? Paris, Mont Saint-Michel, the Taj Mahal, the very poetic one. Damn you! Do you know everything? One of the few advantages of being a ghost. And you... you can go everywhere? No, there are limitations. No, I'm tied to this house. And you're welcome to it. Thank you, Simon. Or should I call you Stephen? Oh, it's so confusing since you switched identities. Which, by the by, reminds me, while you were dining and making all your escape plans, I signed all the papers old lawyer Holcomb left, so you are free to go. I, uh, I suppose I should say thank you. <laughs> call it my wedding gift. What, what about the check for that Demetrius or whatever his name was? Oh, forget about that. That was a private deal. He doesn't need your check. Other arrangements have been made to satisfy that debt, believe me. So, this, as the word goes, is goodbye. Yes. I'm sorry I won't be able to attend the wedding and give the bride away. I never intend to come near this house again. Pity. I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. You like the cabin all right, Becky? Oh, it couldn't be more perfect. How about your new husband? Ditto. Well, just keep feeling that way. <laughs> uh, darling, you, you'll have to excuse me for a minute. Why? Oh, I don't know. The, the assistant purser just told me someone from the office needs an okay or something before we sail. He doesn't have a pass, so they wouldn't let him aboard. I'll be back in ten minutes. What? Well, uh, don't miss getting back on the boat. Don't you worry. It took me long enough to catch it. Mr. Hood? Yeah. You from uh, Fairley Company and Sons? Yeah, right. You were uh, Stephen Fairley? Yes. 
Good. I got a message from you from my boss. Uh, can we step over here to my car? Well, the boat's too near sailing. You just tell me here. At the car. I just play it real cool, Mr. Fairley, and don't make any sudden moves. The jab, you feel, is the muzzle of a short barrel 38. Okay. Shall we step over to the car? taking me. A little spot on the Jersey Flats. Ain't exactly quicksand, but you'd be surprised how fast that slime sucks up a body that ain't moving. You're, you're not going to kill me. You know, dope is a funny game. Using your business as a front was a great way for us to get the stuff in. But when you try the old double O, Mr. P, oh, that was crazy, Stephen. No, look, you don't, you don't understand. I'm... I'm not Stephen. What? Stephen is dead. I'm Simon. I had nothing to do with this. Yeah, sure. See, now look, when we had the automobile accident, all I did was change places. Sure. I mean, Stephen was driving and I was... Oh, for God's sake, look, I just got married. My wife is... Please, you've got to listen! Okay. Dump him in the swamp and let's get out of here, Giorgio. <laughs> Simon, back home again. Table set for two this time. That's all there is. The rest are gone. Just you and me. Oh, I know how it feels, but you might as well face it. Eternity is such a long time. And since we were twins, it seemed a shame Simon was alive and Stephen dead. This way, I'm still dead. But even Stephen. A footnote to the tale you just heard. Mr. Hood's quagmire proved less effective than its reputation, and Simon's body was recovered. Since he had served in the army, an examination of his fingerprints established the deception about the death of the twins. The tangled result of the estate is unimportant since there was no heir. But at least Becky gained a measure of peace in finding out that she had not tied her life to a man who would have ruined it. I'll be back shortly. Whenever the dead try to control the living, the seeds of disaster are sown. At the beginning of our tale, Justine Fairley lay in his bed, whitened with the wax of death, his stubborn mind at peace with the thought that he had settled the future of his twin sons. Sick transit gloria mundi, so passed the triumphs of this world. He could no more control the accident of their birth than he could their deaths. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Paul Hecht, Joan Lovejoy, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. I thought that since I'm a married woman, now we we just have to get used to a a different kind of relationship. Uh huh. You can tell when I'm lying. I can tell when you're lying. Otis broke his promise, didn't he? What promise? His promise never to paint your picture. Well, how, how can you say that? Why don't I ask you? You can't ask him. He isn't home. All right, I'll wait. But he, he may be gone all day. No rang the bell just before. Oh. Hi, Bert. How are you? Oh, just fine. Just fine. You've been painting, I see. Anyone I know? Well, I haven't been painting exactly. I've been cleaning brushes, things like that. You know, chores. Why don't we go inside and see? Bert! Bert! If, if you walk into that studio, I... I'll never talk to you again as long as I live. If I don't walk into that studio, you'll be dead in a month. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of primeval dread, to the fear you can hear. Do things have souls? Do natural forces embody malicious spirits? That was the primitive belief of mankind, stifled, they say, by the rise of civilization. But is it dead? Or does there move within us still the distorted shadow of some long-forgotten lore, dark images we dare not face? Jeff Moore never found the answer, but the question shattered his life. Stop. Stop. You devil chin D. I defy you. You called me and I'm here, Chindi. I'm here. I defy you. No. No. Jeff, 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 don't what? wake up. What? It's a dream. You're having a nightmare. Oh, wake up. Katie. Katie, that terrible dream oh, again. Don't even relax. Just a storm. The horse again. The horse galloping toward me. The rider wrapped in a long black shroud. When he turned his face to me, it was a mass of melting flesh. It was the face of the man we buried out there in the sand. Katie. Katie. mystery drama, The Devil God, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Mary Jane Higby and stars Ruby Dee and Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. character of our drama tonight will never appear. I think you will feel his presence, however, as thousands have felt it through the long centuries that brought us out of the prehistoric cave to the place where we now stand, as Jeff and Katie Moore, a young couple from New England, felt it among the stark cliffs of the Southwest. But let Katie tell you about it. storm last night shook this old house like a terrier shaking a rat. I lay trembling in my bed while it crashed its way towards us, then burst in a roar overhead. Jeff started screaming in his sleep, the way he does nowadays. Help me. And I ran into comfort. Help me. Please help me. Jeff, Jeff, darling, wake up, wake up. It's just a storm. It's the horse again. The horse galloping toward me, the rider wrapped in a long black shroud. Suddenly he turned his face to me and it was a mass of melting flesh, the face of the man we buried out there in the sand. Oh, Katie. It's all right, dear. It'll be all right, all right. Katie, Katie, am I ever going to get over this? Funny thing about a vicious storm, how innocent and clean the world looks afterward. In the morning, the air was so shimmering clear that for a moment I thought I was back in Antelope Valley that day I first saw it nestling in the desert mountains. I didn't know then the terror hidden in those hills. I wish I had known. Dear God, how I wish I had known. I'm sorry about the shape this road's in, folks. This is a road? <laughs> Are we on our own property yet, Mr. Curdy? Yeah, it will be as soon as we cross the little Yaki River. It's only 20 miles or so to the house from there. Mm-hmm. Your uncle left you a fine ranch. You're going to be mighty happy when you see what you've got. I'll be mighty happy if I've still got my teeth. <laughs> it's awfully nice of you to bring us all the way out here. Well, couldn't let you come out alone the first time. You being strangers to this part of the country and all. Now, when we get to the top of this rise, you're going to see a grade A job of government bungling. A few months ago, they sent out some fancy eastern engineers. 
First thing they did was pull out the bridge that was here and move it ten miles downriver. Never stopped to find out there was a house 20 miles back and this bridge was the only access. Oh, dear. Well, what do we do? Uh, the jeep won't make it through the gully. Yeah. At least I... I think it will. Hmm. I better walk down first, though, to make sure. Shall I come with you? No. No use both of us getting our feet wet. Well, I can see why he said we'd never make it in our own car. Honey, when I think of your uncle sinking all of his money in this godforsaken country... Godforsaken? Why, it's beautiful. Come on, darling. You've seen too many John Wayne movies. It's valuable, that. I know, I know. And I'm lucky. I married a beautiful woman who turned out to be an heiress. <laughs> I'm glad we didn't know my Uncle Bush was making me his heir. I'd have thought you were marrying me for my vast holdings. <laughs> <laughs> and I just hope that among the vast holdings, he left a bottle of scotch. <laughs> Because I'm going to need it if Joe Purdy manages to get us across these craters of the moon. Well, okay. I just wanted to be sure that there was no quicksand. We're really going down into that ravine. Yep. Here we go. Ooh, it's awfully steep, isn't it? Oh, oh boy. Yeah. Well, made it. Uh, shook up. Sorry, folks. Well, that's the little Yaki River. The river? You said it wasn't a quart of water in it. Still not now. But don't you ever try what I just did. Come a flash flood and it'll be a wall of water rushing down. You know, I've seen little jackrabbits caught in it. Even rattlesnakes. That's why your uncle was so mad about that bridge. You can't get to your land from the new one without scaling the cliff. What? Mr. Purdy, wait a minute now. Are you saying that once you leave us, we're completely cut off, trapped? Oh, no. The ranch hands can always get you out. Uh, Kenneth, he's your foreman. He talks English real good. Well, what do the others talk? <laughs> Their own language. They're Indians. Indians? Why didn't anybody tell us all this? Well, now, I wouldn't worry. Well, your uncle had the best ranch hands in the state. That's why Antelope Valley's such a fine money-making outfit. Well, not yet. Don't borrow trouble. Wait till we get there. See what it's like. I know what it's like. Flash floods, quicksand, rattlesnakes, and six feet of snow. Katie, we are moving into a trap. But Jeff's misgivings faded when Antelope Valley lay spread before us. The long, white, L-shaped house, half-hidden in cottonwood trees and bordered by bright flowers. And winding in the distance, the gully that marked the upper course of the little Yaki. Some Indians were standing around the corral. I waved, but they only stared back. And here we are, folks. Well, oh. after what we've been through, this is kind of like Shangri-La, isn't it? We'll just get the luggage out. Oh, there's your foreman... Hi, Ken. Hi, Joe. Uh, Mr. Uh, and Mrs. Moore, Kenneth Yazzie. Yes. Uh, nice to meet you, Kenneth. Yes. I'll help with your bags. Well, thank you. And if you'll excuse me, I'll get back to work. We're just finishing up. Uh, all right if I show you around later? Oh, oh yes. Of uh, Freezer's well stocked, isn't it, Ken? Sure is. A couple of sides of beef and a lot of game. Now, don't you carry anything, Mrs. Moore. <laughs> just get the door for us, please. I've had the house open and airing for you all day. What a oh, nice hey. room. What a great fire! And look at this. You wouldn't expect a picture window in a ranch house, now would you? Oh, your <laughs> uncle built himself a real modern Oh, Oh, look, look, mm -hmm. up on the hill. <gasps> what a beauty. Oh, you mean the horse. Hey, that's a palomino, isn't it? What? Isn't that a palomino out there? Oh, it's gone. I think you must be mistaken. I think you saw a deer. No, no, it was a horse. Oh, all with a right. wonderful golden mane. I'm going to get some sugar and see if I can't. No. Well, leave it alone. Why, Ken? That horse is no good, Joe. Hmm? Oh, what do you mean? There's a bad feeling about that horse, Mrs. Moore. Leave her alone. She doesn't belong here. Whose horse is it? Bad feeling. Don't go near her. Let her go. But doesn't she belong to us? Doesn't she? Believe me, Mrs. Moore. You staying overnight, Joe? <laughs> no, no. I have to get back to the office. The title company won't run itself, you know. Well, you'll stay and have a drink with us, won't you? Uh, the boys want to talk to you, Joe. 
Yeah, sure, sure. I'll go out to the corral and say hello and, uh... <laughs> yes, Mr. Moore, I reckon I better have one for that road. We'll be right back. Well, what do you suppose that was all about? The horse, you mean? Hmm. That Indian looked so funny. I thought he looked frightened. A valuable animal like that shouldn't be running around loose. Oh, come on, darling. I, I want to see the rest of the house. Um, this... Oh, look at this kitchen. It's, it's huge. Hey, you can walk right inside the closets. Boy, hey, your Uncle Bush Hyatt was no teetotaler. I'll say that for him. <laughs> Get the ice, honey, and I'll see if I can find some glasses. Mm. There's enough liquor here to last the whole winter. What are you staring at? That horse again. Hmm? Look through this window. <gasps> it's heavenly. Oh, Jeff. Boy, Joe Purdy's sure deep in conversation with those Indians. They're kind of a solemn-looking lot, aren't they? No, I don't, uh, I don't think I would exactly call this place heavenly, honey. Hostile seems a better word. You don't like it. Oh, Jeff, give it a few weeks' trial and... Look, it's beautiful, Kate, but... Oh, I guess I'm just tired. Hello? Hey, we're well, in the kitchen here, oh, getting it all together. What do you have? Bourbon or scotch? Oh, bourbon. Bourbon's fine. I haven't found the soda yet. Well, tap water be all right. <laughs> Never mind the water. Uh, I'm going to ask you folks to uh, put me up for the night. Oh, wonderful. Oh, sure. Wonderful. Well, here's to a happy life in Antelope Valley. Yes, cheers, Joe. Cheers. You don't mind if I call you that, do you? <laughs> of course not. Everybody does. Well, I... Uh, I have to ride out behind the hills tomorrow. Oh, why? There's a job to do back there. Nasty job, too. The ranch hands asked me if I'd do it. Why'd they do it themselves? Well, they can't. There's something to do with their religion. Oh, and by the way, I want to talk to you about that. You've got the best cow hands in the state. Now, you'll get along just fine if, uh, if you respect their ways, their religion. Well, what is their religion? Well, as near as I can figure, the Indian lives in a different world from us. He lives in a world of spirits. <laughs> Where we see a cloud, he sees a spirit. Where we hear the wind... Well, that's animatism. Well, I wouldn't know about that. But the important thing is not to rile those spirits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll drink to that. No, no, I'm, I'm serious. And I'd advise you to be... Because, well, I've seen some mighty strange things in my time. And now, about that horse, uh, Palomino... Now, how about that? Now, is it ours or isn't it? Well, I figure it isn't. You see, anything the lightning god has touched belongs to him. You mean the horse was struck by lightning? Hmm. It didn't hurt her. One of those freak accidents. But now she belongs to the lightning god. He'll strike down anybody who tries to take what is his. So, uh, leave her alone, okay? Oh, come on. That's nonsense. Plain superstition. It's what they believe. Well, Kenneth doesn't go for this rubbish, does he? He seems like an educated man. He was a track star at UCLA. Almost made the Olympics. But Ken is an Indian. I see. All right, now look, let's get this straight. The horse belongs to this ranch, right? And it's a valuable animal, isn't it? I reckon so. Now, you're saying that I can't keep her, can't even sell her because of some whammy that somebody's put on her? I'm saying you won't go near that horse if you know what's good for you. But that's crazy. Now, don't be so sure. Well, you don't believe this drivel, do you? I don't believe it, and I don't not believe it. Well, that horse is going back into the barn. It's ours, and I'm keeping it. You take that attitude, and you'll be in trouble. Bad trouble. That is superstition right out of the Dark Ages. Older than that, I reckon. But it's their belief. And this would be one hell of a time to try to talk them out of it. They've got a dead man lying back in the hills to prove it. A dead man? If you're so cocksure about these things, ride out with me tomorrow when I go bury him. Katie leaves the two men, still stubbornly arguing the pros and cons of superstition, to stand at her bedroom window, watching the motionless stars. As one springs to sudden life and goes skimming across the sky, she makes a wish, then smiles at herself. A meteor, nothing more. 
What power has it to grant good fortune? Troubled, she turns to her bed and her first night's sleep in the eerie stillness of Antelope Valley. I'll be back shortly with Act Two of The Devil God. Profound stillness has settled over the remote ranch, broken only by the occasional howl of a coyote. In spite of her uneasiness about the gruesome task her city-bred husband has agreed to undertake with Joe Purdy, Katie Moore has fallen into a deep sleep. She awakes with a start. Someone is moving about the room. Jeff? Oh, I didn't mean to wake you, honey. I'm sorry. Oh, it's too dark. It sure is. When Joe Purdy says early, he means it. I'll get you breakfast. No, no, no. We've had breakfast. Don't get up. Katie, do you know where that blue cotton shirt of mine is? I think I put it... Oh, yes. Second drawer down. Okay, then. So how's the girl of the Golden West? Did, did you hear anything? No. Like what? I thought I heard hoofbeats. <sighs> Toss me my dressing gown, will you? Whew, it's chilly, isn't it? Yes, there, there she is again. The Palomino. Oh, poor thing. Probably hungry. You know, Katie, this whole setup seems fishy. You mean about the horse? The whole situation on this ranch. After you went to bed last night, I found out the name of this guy that we're going to bury. Little Gambler. And whose father do you think he is? Kenneth Yazzie's father? That's right, our college graduates. Now, superstition or no superstition, you don't leave your father lying out where the buzzards and coyotes can get at him. Ooh, Jeff, don't. Mm. I'm sorry, honey, but... I tell you, I won't be surprised if we find him shot through the head or stabbed in the back. If we can tell from what's left of him. There's something phony going on. I'm not sure Joe isn't part of it. Oh, no, Jeff. Well, you take this guy's name, Little Gambler... Now, honey, you know that horse is worth a lot of money. You think there was a fight over the horse? I don't know. And I sure don't go for all this mumbo-jumbo about lightning gods and rainbow gods and spirits of death. It's too easy and out. Uh, can you see? Is that horse still there? Uh-huh. Poor thing. It needs a good currying. Now, as soon as I'm dressed, I'm going out. I'm putting it into the barn. And, Katie, you see that it stays there. <laughs> was beginning to rise as I watched wiry Joe Purdy and my cheerful blonde husband ride out of sight. I turned to unpacking and settling into my new home. Just after midday, a sudden commotion drew me out into the yard. The barn door was open, and in the dark interior, a golden mane flashed through the air as the Palomino reared suddenly. I could make out two shadowy figures behind us. Stop that! My husband put the horse in the barn. She's to stay there. Now, don't let her out. Doesn't either of you speak English? Something wrong, Mrs. Moore? Yes. My husband put the Palomino in the barn this morning, and I caught these men trying to drive her out. I don't think so, Mrs. Moore. Oh, yes, I saw them. The horse is no good. You mean she's vicious? That's absurd. She's as gentle as a lamb. No good for the ranch. She was my uncle's horse, wasn't she? Kenneth, I'm serious about this. We're keeping her. And from now on, I want the boys to take good care of her. They have other work to do. Oh, come on. All this fuss is because she was struck by lightning, isn't it? Let's settle this once and for all. This was my uncle's ranch. Now my husband and I occupy the place that he did. Your uncle understood Indian ways. I understand, too. I know how the ranch hands feel about the lightning god, and I sympathize. But I don't for one minute believe in it, and I don't think you do. Mrs. Moore, let the horse go. Otherwise, I cannot be responsible. You don't have to be. Just do as I say. <laughs> He turned on his heel and left me standing there in the blazing heat. Tears of fury stung my eyes. I watched a buzzard circling in the clear sky. Then the thought of Jeff and the grisly job he had set out to do sent a shiver through me and I ran back into the cool ranch house. I prowled restlessly from room to room until in my uncle's office I came across a photograph album. 
pictorial record of his days as a trader on the Indian reservation. A recent snapshot, not yet pasted in the book, fell out in my lap. On it, my uncle had written, Scheherazade, first prize, Santa Fe, 1972. It was the Palomino. I was so engrossed in the album that I, I didn't notice the change in the weather. A wind had come up and a door started banging. And I ran to fasten it. And I could see the cottonwoods outside writhing in the wind. A few Indians had gathered near the corral. One of them, taller than the rest, wore a big black hat. He was pointing to the east, where a dark, menacing cloud hung over the hills. I felt stifled. I sat down, gasping for breath, and watched while the ugly thing spread like some monstrous growth across the sky. Shortly after sunset, Jeff and Joe Purdy returned. Honey? Oh, Jeff! Jeff, I'm so glad you're back. Not as glad as I am. What a day. Nasty chore. I reckon it gave your husband a bad turn. You better oh, believe it. You look exhausted, darling. Aren't you coming in, Joe? No, no, I'll just return our ponies to the corral. Then I gotta get on my way. Mm. I want to keep ahead of that storm, at least till I cross the little yaki. You'll excuse me, Mrs. Moore? Oh, of course. Oh, goodbye, goodbye, and thanks, Joe, for everything. So long, Joe. I'll see you soon. Hmm? Sure, sure. I'll keep in touch. Oh, Ken, yeah? take these ponies. I've got to get going. Okay. You'll make it if you hurry, Joe. So long. Oh, come on in, darling. Yeah. <sighs> Those cow ponies are tough little animals. I don't think anything else could have made this trek. It was rugged, huh? You'd never believe it, honey. I'll say this for the lightning god when he sets out to do a job. That boat must have hit the Indian in the head and spun him right around. His face was like melted. Ooh. Even his moccasins were split. And the funny thing, his blouse was untouched. But the sleeves were gone. Apparently went up in smoke. And the flesh on his arms was peeled to the wrist. Do you think it really was lightning? Oh, no question about it. Freak accident. Strange how often people use that word about lightning, hmm? Freak. Yeah. You have to see it to know why. I mean, it looks... It looks deliberate. You know, like two guys are in a boat and one is struck by lightning and killed and the other one isn't touched. You know what I mean? Hmm. The Indians think it's malicious spirits. Chindi, they call it. Well, it's nonsense, of course, but... I tell you, standing alone with Joe out there in the desert... Well, it was funny, but... It was like I could feel a... A presence. I kept looking over my shoulder. I told Joe, and he said, Yep, Chin D. That's the death devil, Chin D. Jeff. Well, that, look, honey, I was darn glad to get away from there. It's getting dark. That evil presence was. I better put on some more lights. Where, where's the light switch? By the front door. Oh, oh, yes. Um... Come on in the kitchen, dear. I've got a good, rich beef stew on the stove, and you'll feel better when you've eaten. Mm hmm. What was the scenery like back there? Mm, sky, sand, and sagebrush. The handiwork of Chin D. Storm. My goodness, it's black outside. I tell you, I wouldn't want to be Joe Purdy driving back to town now. Oh, lightning, look. Sheet lightning, isn't it? Scary, but beautiful. Lit up the whole hill. The Indians say it was Little Gambler's fault. His fault that lightning struck him? Mm-hmm. They say he rode a horse that fire from the sky hit last year. The Palomino? That's right. And he knew the lightning god gets mad if anybody takes what's his. You know, Katie, I'm afraid we're going to have to give her up. Oh, no. She's a jewel, a prize winner, you know. And she's been so neglected. It's awful. Uncle Bush was very proud of her. How do you know? Well, I found a picture of him standing beside her the day she took first at some horse show. Well, we can't keep her. Jeff, you're not going to let them drive her away. Honey, there are forces around us that we don't dare contend with. Jeff, what are you talking about? You know it's superstition. It's easy to say that here in this cozy house. But out there... In those bleak, burning dunes, I tell you, Katie, there was something. I could feel it. I feel it now. <gasps> that was a close one, wasn't it? Yes. It's not sheet lightning. It's fork lightning. 
I'm going out and open the barn door. Jeff, Jeff, you're not. Not in this weather. I won't let you drive, a, drive her out in, in, into this weather. What's the matter with you? You said yourself this is nonsense. It's bringing us trouble. Bad trouble. I can feel it coming like a hot wind. You've been out in the hot sun all day, and Joe Purdy has hypnotized you with this rubbish. Joe says the ranch hands will all leave if we try to keep her. Let them. We'll get others. They have good jobs here, and good jobs aren't so easy to get these days. But, honey, this morning I felt the way you do. But damn it all, you haven't seen what I've seen. That Indian looked like he'd been scalped. I know, I saw it. I'm not just talking. Now, we've got to get rid of the horse. Jeff, listen to me, dear. If we give in now, we'll lose all authority. You know, I had an unpleasant scene with Kenneth earlier. He was very rude. We can't start out that way. This taboo, or, or whatever it is, is stupid and barbaric, and we're not going to yield to it. Now, I'm going to make some coffee. Stay away from the sink. And that's not superstition. The pipes form a perfect ground for the lightning. You mean I can't even run water for coffee? Not until the worst of the storm is over. Now, it's heading for us right now. And Joe was telling me that before lightning strikes, you can sometimes feel an electric charge run through your body. You feel your hairs rise. It's the hand of Chin D. Then you're probably going to be hit, and the only thing to do is drop flat on the ground and pray. Oh, my Oh, hit a power line, I guess. Well, what do we do? Now, just keep calm. Lights will probably go on again. It's awfully dark. Have we got a flashlight? Yeah, but it's in the car back in town. Matches? Not since I quit smoking. There's got to be some candles around here. I saw some this morning. I remember now, I was putting things in the kitchen closet. I know where they are. There must be matches there, too. I'll get them. Let's see now. It's over here past the sink. Yes. Mm-hmm. There... In the back on the third... Oh! Katie! Oh! What happened? Oh! Katie, are you all right? Oh! Katie, where are you? Groping his way through the darkness, Jeff struggles against the sudden rush of his own superstitious fear. But... One man's superstition is another man's firmly held faith. And perhaps the only safe conduct through the uncertainties of this valley of shadows is a healthy respect for the beliefs of others. Common courtesy or common sense should teach us that. If not, the powers that be may find harsher ways to bring the lesson home. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Tomorrow night on News Radio 78, William Prince and Ann Costello star in the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presentation, The Wishing Stone, at 10.30 on News Radio 78. An unfamiliar house, a wrong step, and a headlong plunge into black emptiness. Katie Moore lies dazed and frightened on a rough cement floor. Oh. Katie? Mm-hmm. Katie, where are you? Are you all right? Mm-hmm. I think so. Don't try to get to me, Jeff. Wait. I'll see if I can get up. Oh! Oh! Are you hurt? Um, I don't know. Yes, I... I think I fell down some steps. Oh, my shoulder. Don't move. Damn it, if I only had a match. <laughs> yes, there, there, there are steps here. Be, be careful. All right. Now, wh- wh- where are you, darling? Here. Oh, okay. All right, listen, do, do, you, think, do you think you can put your arm around my neck? Uh, I'll try. Oh, ooh, ooh, easy now. No. Huh? I'd better not try to move you then till we get some light. I gotta find those candles. I'll be right back, darling. Watch yourself. All right. Watch yourself. Hello? Tomorrow? Oh, Ken. Thank God. You brought a light. I could see from the bunkhouse that the place was still dark. I figured you didn't have a flashlight, so I brought a couple of kerosene lamps. But my wife fell down the cellar steps, and I'm afraid she's badly hurt. I didn't dare try to move her. Ken's brought us some lamps, dear. 
It just happened a minute ago. She felt on these steps. She was looking for candles. She thought she was going into the kitchen closet, and she opened the wrong door. I, I, I can't move. I can't turn over. Let's see. Oh. Oh. oh boy. Um. Looks like it's the shoulder. My, collarbone. My legs feel all right. I can move them. Try slipping your arm around her waist. I think I can hold her no. so it won't be too bad. Huh? But oh, it's easy going to hurt some, Mrs. Moore. Ready? Yes. Right. Think yes. we dare lift her? Yes. I've got her. Tell me when you're ready. All right now. There. Oh. Easy, darling. Does it hurt? A little. I, I think I can walk up. Okay. Easy. Nice and slow. Got you. Careful. Now, one step at a time. Mm. Bring the lamp. Yeah, I have. Take it easy, darling. Easy now. Just, just a few more steps. Just get me to the sofa. Okay. Can we get the lights on again, Kenneth? Not a chance. Until the worst of this is over. I have a hunch it hit the generator. I'm going to have to get back to the bunkhouse. All right, here we are now. Easy now, Mrs. Moore. Careful now. Easy, dear. I don't want to leave the ranch crew alone too long. They're, uh, they're restless. Yes, I understand. All right, go ahead. And Ken? Yes? Go to the barn and get rid of her. My horse? No, no. Katie, oh, no. don't make waves. Not now. You're right, you're right. Do what you think's best. Thanks. It'll make things a whole lot easier for me. That was a bright flash. Lit up the whole room. Oh, my God. What? What is it? Did you see that? Yes, I saw. They can't do this to us. Stop them. I'll try. Well, what's the matter? What happened? The ranch hands, honey. They're leaving. In that last flash, I could see a long line of ponies. They're all just quietly riding away. Oh, Jeff, I'm, I'm frightened. All right, now we have to keep our heads here. We can leave, too. I don't know. People have been in worse spots than this. Now that we have plenty of provisions, it can't rain forever. I never saw such a downpour. Ken? Did they take all the ponies? No. There's one left, but it was badly hurt a few days ago. Kenneth, why did they all leave us? There's bad feeling here. You mean they're frightened? I'm damned if I understand it. They're not afraid of dying. It is the spirit of death they respect. It is chin deep. Indians are proud before men. They're not proud before their gods. Black Hat is a medicine man. He says chin deep is very angry now. He says tonight chin deep will take all Antelope Valley for his own. running a fever. It rained for four days without let-up. But part of the time I was delirious, so my memories are confused. Try to drink this, dear. Mm. I, I want some orchids. Orchids, please, please. Honey, it's chicken broth. Try to take a little, honey. Mr. Moore, I'm afraid it's going to flood. A little yucky? There are sandbags in the barn. We've got to make a dike to protect the house. The river doesn't look that high. Remember... There's no vegetation in these hills to hold the water. A sudden downpour runs right off. Flash flood. Come on. Well, that, that ought to hold for a while. Hey, it's not enough. But it's all we have. Oh, I'm so tired, I'm gonna drop. We've done all we can do. Mr. Moore. We'll have to move to higher ground. When that water hits, the house may go. We can't, man. We can't move Kitty outdoors in her condition. We'll set a tarpaulin tent on the hill. Take blankets. Hurry. It'll come any time now. We were lucky to get out. Look. Great Scott, it's a wall of water. Will the house go? I don't know. Never seen anything like that. It's like a dam at first. Thank God you got us out of there. Yeah. Yes, Kate. Yeah. Where are we? We're in a tent, honey, on the hill back of the house. Stay right here until the worst of the storm has passed. Are you warm enough, darling? Water. Uh, here's the canteen. Let me lift you up, dear. I'm so weak. Careful, honey. There you are. What's the matter? 
Try to be quiet, Dolly. Ken, I've got to get a doctor. Now, if a man had a horse, could he make it out of here now? He might. He knew his way. The barn is still standing. Yes. I'm going to see if that Palomino is there. You could never find the pass. Even in good weather, somebody would have to show you the first time. In a storm like this. Look, I've got to do something. I can't stand by and let my wife die. I'll go out to the barn. No. I don't expect you to touch the horse, Ken. I understand these things better now. You can see that I must go. First, let's see if the horse is still there. Jack. Yes, dear. It's cold. Yeah, the blanket has slipped off. Let me wrap it around you. Where's Ken? He went out to the barn a little while ago. I, I've been dreaming. A man was riding by on a horse. And suddenly the horse burst into flames. Quiet, dear. Quiet, darling. <gasps> Sounds like who? It must be Ken. He's taking the Palomino. Ken, no! Ken, I'll go! Ken, come back! Has he deserted us too? No, he's gone for help. Oh, the poor guy. He must be frightened to death on that Palomino. <laughs> Search and rescue from town. Search and rescue? That's a local organization. They have special equipment. Mostly they go after hunters who get lost in the San Francisco peaks. Well, how did they know about us? The ranch hand sold them. They managed to throw a makeshift bridge across the Yaki down below. Your road is mostly washed out, but they can make it slowly. Thank God. Ken. Yeah? Ken, I want to thank you for what you did. I know what it meant. Yes, it's all right. Look, we were wrong, Ken. We we behaved badly. But when you've lived all your life a certain way and believed certain things, it's just hard to... Well, anyway, everything will be okay now. Uh, I hope you're right. Uh-oh. We better get back under the top when the rain's starting again. Chin D circled around. He's coming from the other side now. Oh, nonsense, man. We'll soon be out of here. through my body. The small hairs on my forearms seemed to rise. I knew that Ken had come back to me. He turned and looked up at the sky, his eyes staring wildly. There was a blinding flash. Then Ken was lying on the ground. Ken! Oh, my God! Kenneth! Don't try to get up, Kitty. Joe... Joe, is he... Yes. He's dead. It was my fault. We goaded him into riding that horse. I wouldn't let her go. I, I, I killed him. I killed him. I killed him. I'll never forgive myself. I'm a murderer. Now, now, Mrs. Moore, it's not your fault. We don't control these things. They're actually... You, you said Chindi would kill anyone who touched his property. You said it. You know you did. It is my fault. It is. It is. I killed Katie, him. Katie, I killed please, him. dear. I killed him. Please. He saved our lives. And, Katie, and now, I stop it. Him. Stop it. <laughs> You have got to get this straight now. It was an accident. Do you hear me? An accident. I, 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 no, I killed him. I'll never forgive myself. It was not an accident. You all know what it was. Why don't you say it? It was, it was Chindi. Oh, God, forgive me. I, 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 I killed him. I believe she was to blame all her life. She's hysterical. Chindi. Chindi. Katie, listen to me. There is no Chindi. What happened was an accident. You've got to hold on to that fact. There's the horse. Get rid of her. Drive her away. Take Mrs. Moore to the truck, boys. We'll have to come back for Kenneth later. No, no. I, I, I won't go unless you bring Kenneth, too. You're not going to leave him here alone. Katie, watch me. I'm going to ride that Palomino. Chindy! I'm taking your horse, Chindy. I defy you. If you're there, show us your power now. I defy you. There is no Chindy. <laughs> Ms. Moore, you there? Oh, 
Just, just Mr. Murchison. Oh, come on in. Oh, yeah. Hands up. Oh, just a second. I'll get the screen off. My, my wife sent this over to you. How nice. Well, she oh. she remembered you always did like it. Banana bread. Uh, yeah. Well, we're glad to have you back with us in Connecticut. We thought we'd lost you to the West. Oh, it's good to be back. Did you see Jeff? He's working over the edge of the wood. There's a tree he says has to come down. It looks sturdy enough to me. Well, if he's talking about the oak near the clump of white birch, it ain't as solid as it looks. Are you planning to stay now for good? Oh, yes. We we sold everything we owned out west. It was beautiful. Mary but... and I drove out there once. It was all too big for me, all too, well, too much. The Connecticut is more cozy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll be getting along. I want to see Jeff. There's something I should tell him about that tree. Uh, tell Mrs. Murchison I'll be over to see her as soon as I get settled. Well, if we can help, just let us know. Oh, what was that? Hmm. Sounds like he felled the tree. Uh, uh, he wasn't going to chop it down. Jeff! Jeff! <laughs> you, you all right, Jeff? Jeff! Mr. Murchison, oh. look! Now go oh. back. Call the police. Oh. Tell them to send an ambulance. We can't Let move me. that tree, just the two of us. Now, quick, girl, quick. Then get the Hesser boys. They're working on the fence. Help. I'm coming, son. Oh, help. <gasps> Mr. Murchison, help me. Lou Hesser will be here in a minute. We'll oh. try to move the tree off you. I don't know what happened. I I just tapped it. I, I was coming to tell you, Jeff. It's, it's rotten all the way through. You see, that tree was struck years ago by lightning. <laughs> Jeff Moore is in a wheelchair now. Nobody knows just why. The doctors say he suffered no permanent injury when that tree fell. But sometimes late at night, when she hears the wind rising, the rain beginning to fall, Katie's thoughts go back to Antelope Valley and Kenneth Yazzie and the Palomino. And she wonders... I'll be back shortly. Lightning strikes, invoking a tribal taboo. Result? Two dead men and a house plunged into darkness. Two months... And 3,000 miles later, a third man is struck down. Coincidence, of course. But what is coincidence? A word. A word we use to explain what we cannot explain. Our cast included Ruby Dee, Mandel Kramer, Leon Janney, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Preview of our next tale. Jenny, that stone ain't gold. Then what is it? It's pyrite. What's pyrite? Oh, it's just what everybody calls. Well, it, uh, it it's a sort of metal. Well, anyways, whatever it is, it's real precious to me. It's my lucky charm. Well, that's why you better not let Pa know what you think about it. Why? He, he cares about gambling more than he cares about anything, and all gamblers are real superstitious. Now, if he knew you had a lucky piece, especially if he heard the crazy story about you and the school burning down, he'd have it off of you so fast that it'd set your head to spinning. It isn't crazy. You heard me wish on the stone for no school, and now there is no school. <laughs> that was just happenstance. You don't think it happened just because I wished it? Of course it didn't. Then I'm going to prove it to you. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to a world we all inhabit too little. The world of imagination. Our own. Yours and mine. Have you ever wondered what it's like to be a ghost? Well, one of this Earth's greatest writers did, Oscar Wilde. And having let his imagination play with the idea, he set down his findings in a ghost story that ranks with the world's finest. The classic tale of the Canterville Ghost. And if by chance you should think that a ghost's life is all wine and roses, why then listen to what went on one night at Canterville Castle. Blood! I must have blood! And when I say blood, I do not mean a drop or two. I mean gallons. Or am I not called Gibeon, the bloodsucker of Bexley Moor? Blood! Oh, give me blood! Blood, my foot! What you need is some oil for those rusty chains. Our mystery drama, The Canterville Ghost, was especially adapted from the Oscar Wilde classic for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Arnold Moss. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Our story takes place in Canterville Castle, ancestral home of the De Canterville family since the 15th century. You immediately assume, I have no doubt, that the castle is in England. Well, it isn't. It was, but it isn't anymore. For you see, that well-known multimillionaire Hiram Otis had it dismantled stone by stone, transported to the United States, and re-erected stone by stone on his own estate in the Midwest. So it is that one fine afternoon, we find him, Hiram, and his wife, Martha, and his lovely daughter, Virginia, and Jeffrey de Canterville, her fiancé, in the newly restored library of the newly erected castle of the Cantervilles. Well, Mr. Otis, I hope you're satisfied with the job I've done. Canterville Castle re-erected, lock, stock, and barrel, even to the ancestral gardens which surround it. Well, the castle's okay, but I don't know about the gardens. The guy I hired to be the general manager when we opened the place as a tourist resort Says the pool ought to be where you put the pine woods. But, Daddy, that's the exact area where the pine woods were in England. Well, Ginny, dear, tourists won't know that. But that was part of the deal when Daddy bought the castle from Jeff and hired him to re-erect it here. That nothing would be changed. Well, business is business. If it'll be more convenient for tourists to have the pool where the pine woods are... Yeah. Now, what's this? Well, you know what that is, Mr. Otis. It's the blood stain. That's the spot in front of the fireplace where Sir Simon de Canterville stabbed his wife to death way back in 1601. I told you I wanted it removed. And I told you it can't be removed. You got any Otis bathroom cleanser around, Jeff? Yes, yes, of course, in the cleaning closets. You told me to stock it. Get a can of it. But Mr. Otis really... Otis it... bathroom cleanser is guaranteed to get rid of any stain. And it'll get rid of this one. Go on, get me a can of it. Good heavens, that vase. Oh, dear, it fell off the mantelpiece. No, it didn't fall off, Mrs. Otis. It was knocked off, I'd say, by Sir Simon de Canterville. The ghost? Yes, I'm afraid he doesn't like the idea of removing that bloodstain. However, I'll get the cleanser. Him and his ghost. Do you think I was born yesterday? Jeff wouldn't lie to you, Daddy. <laughs> and, and if he says the castle's haunted, then... Now, look, Ginny. Just because this fortune hunter fiancé of yours, Lord Jeffrey Canterville, believes in ghosts, doesn't mean I have to. Daddy, if you call Jeff a fortune hunter once more, just once more... No, I'm not... Okay, okay, honey. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. All I want is your happiness, sweetie. And if you make you happy, fine, fine. Here we are, Mr. Otis. A fresh can of Otis bathroom cleanser. All right, let me have it. Now watch. I spray it on the blood stain. 
You bring a cloth to wipe it off with? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh, never mind. Use my handkerchief. Now, one wipe, so. Where's your blood stain now? Oh, Hiram, it's gone. What else? An Otis guarantee is an Otis guarantee. It will come back. Not after an Otis cleanser treatment, it won't. Oh! Oh! oh. What, what was that? Oh, what is it? It's the ghost again, Mrs. Otis. Oh. No, it was the wind or uh, something. But there isn't any wind. Well, there was something else, but not a ghost. I just plain don't believe in ghosts, and that's the end of that. Well, if you ask me, Mr. Otis, it's only the beginning. Eleanor! Eleanor! Oh, blast the woman, where is she? Here, Simon, dear. Here I am. Get the paint bucket. We have to repaint oh, the stain. Again? I promise you, however often Mr. Hiram Otis erases my blood stain. My blood stain, dear. Oh, all right, all right, yours. But you wouldn't have had it if it hadn't been for me. You do forgive me. Oh, my dear, I have forgiven you at least once every hundred years since it happened. I should not be here otherwise. And the least I can do is to see that your stay here remains peaceful by giving that barbarous American his comeuppance. Fear not, my dearest love. It is Sir Simon de Canterville, me, against Mr. Hiram Otis, him. But I truly believe there's little doubt as to the outcome of the battle. <laughs> A blue blood stain? What do you mean a blue blood stain? Uh, just what I say, Mr. Otis. The stain's reappeared, and this time it's blue, Daddy. Now, look, I don't know what you two are up to. Up to? For your information, the boss painter who's redecorating the upstairs bedrooms complained that somebody's stealing his paint. And you think that we, that Jeff and I would... Who else? But why would you think that? Because the way I see it... Uh... Yes? How do you see it? Well, I don't know how I see it. All I know is it doesn't make sense. And we better start making some sense around here because we open in a week. Now get rid of that stain. Once and for all, get rid of it. Do you realize that I have repainted that blood stain by the fireplace for separate times, and each time that meddling American has had it removed. I should think you'd want to forget it. After all, it's a reminder of why you are doomed to haunt Canterville Castle. Oh, dear, and I with you. But you are not. You can leave any time you wish, Eleanor. Oh, Simon, not without you. Oh, my dear. <laughs> Was ever man so loved by woman as I by you? Or I buy you. Uh, and yes, I killed you. Because you loved me. But however you put it, I condemned us both to eternal misery. Well, it shall be misery in peace. For nearly 400 years, I've haunted Canterville Castle without hindrance. Yet what that vile upstart has put us through in the past three years, tearing down the castle around our heads, building it up again around our heads, and oh, the noise, the noise. And now he means to turn it, my castle, into what they call a tourist attraction. Never! My dearest, what can you do? That beastly American must be driven out. And... His family with him. I know. Let me see what I have in the way of grisly costumes. Ah, yes, yes, yes. I think this should do the trick quite neatly. Which is it? Gaunt Gibeon, the bloodsucker of Bexley Moor. Oh, that's smashing. <laughs> I won't let you get married till you get a job. But, Daddy, Jeff doesn't need a job. He has all the money you paid him for Canterville Castle. Have you? Have you, Jeff? You know I haven't, Mr. Otis. But obviously, Ginny doesn't. You didn't tell her. 
Tell her what, Otis? Yes, what? Well, tell her. Ginny, I'm afraid that just about every cent your father paid for Canterville went to pay off back taxes, liens, mortgages, interest payments, and the Lord only knows what. Oh, Jeff. Well, don't you see, that's why I sold Canterville in the first place. I had to. I, I, I couldn't keep it up anymore. I had no choice. It was, it was sell or lose everything. So you see, he's broke. Flat bust. Now, just a moment. I have the promise of a job, Mr. Otis, a top-flight architectural firm in New York. The promise of a job? Now, look, Jeff, there'll be no marriage oh. until... Oh. What's that? I, I don't know. I'm afraid I do. It's, it's the Canterville ghost. The ghost? Come on, Jeff. Come on now. Aren't these tricks of yours getting just a little childish? Now, Mr. Otis, believe me, this is no act. It's the real thing. Whenever the ghost moans like this, it means he's going to put in an appearance. And I've seen some of those appearances. Now, Mrs. Otis, Ginny, you'd, uh, you'd better come with me. Oh, where to? Well, anywhere but here. I'm not afraid of the ghost myself. He's never done me any harm, but his appearance can be positively ghastly. And you'd better not see it, either of you. No, I'm staying here. What? What? I've Ginny? been hoping to see him, Jeff. Oh. Hoping to see the ghost? Yes, Mother. Oh, dear. Somehow, I have a feeling I won't be afraid of him. Don't ask me why. I can't explain the feeling. I just know I won't be. <laughs> of course you won't. Jeff lets you in on his little gag. But I suppose I'm to be scared to death, huh? Oh, but Daddy, <laughs> there is a ghost. You've got to believe it. Oh, oh, oh. Look! Oh, oh, oh my heavens! Blood! I must have blood! <laughs> he, he's got to be kidding. When I say blood, I do not mean a drop or two. I mean gallons. For am I not Gaunt Gibeon, the blood sucker of Bexley Moor? Blood! Blood, my foot! What you need is some oil for those rusty chains. And I just happen to have a can of Otis all purpose here in this desk drawer. Cringe, thou knave. Grovel in abject fear before me. Ah, ah, here's that can of Otis oil. Oh! Oh, knock off the screaming. You got nothing to scream about. Because believe me, this oil will do the trick for those chains of yours. Leave off! I'm ruining my chain. Daddy, stop it. Leave him alone. Another squirt, oh, my Daddy, dear. Stop it. Give me that cat. Here now. Leave him alone. Can't you see how, oh. how unhappy he is? Oh, now, look, Jenny. Any guy tries to pull a gag on this me. Is no like gag, that. no trick. This is misery. Oh, look at his face. Look into his eyes. He's in agony. I've never felt so sorry for anyone in my life. You. You feel sorry for me? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. No one has felt sorry for me in over 370 years. I do. Well, you... You frighten me. Oh, no, you can't be. You couldn't be. No, no. Not the golden girl. Oh, come on, you two. Stop it. Nice little act, but just a little creaky in spots. You clod. You lout. You poltroon. Is it thus you'd taunt a noble lord of Canterville? Hear me, then. I sought but to warn you hence by harrowing up your soul. But there's another way to be rid of you. Death. No, I... I... No, 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 please, no, please, I beg you, don't kill him, don't, don't. But I don't sake them, child. Be warned and get thee hence. I am Simon of Canterville, an easy wrought into murderous rage. So be gone, be gone, be gone. Do you believe now? That he's a real ghost. I sure do. Well, I, I guess we'd better do what he wants us to do, Otis. Let's leave the castle. Oh, no. Are you saying that you won't... You do bet I am. I paid a fortune for this joint. I'd rather die than see that money go down the drain. Oh, no. 
I'll tear this damn castle down again, stone by stone, before he gets the satisfaction of seeing me run. You hear that, Buster? Stone by stone. <laughs> It certainly appears that for once, for the first time in nearly 400 years, the ghost of Sir Simon de Canterville has met his match. What happens, you may ask, when ancient English ghost meets eyeball to eyeball with modern American business tycoon? We'll learn more when I return shortly with Act Two. 69 degrees in midway, Lupin Lake front temperature 70, it'll be a pleasant night. you know, Sir Simon de Canterville, or rather I should say the ghost of Sir Simon de Canterville, can't be blamed for threatening to kill Hiram Otis. After all, it is his castle, or it was, and, well, how would you feel if you'd lived somewhere for nearly 400 years, only to have someone you'd never seen before threaten to tear the place down, stone by stone? Now, you really can't blame him for being in a towering rage. Eleanor! I shall rend him limb from limb. Oh, Simon, perhaps we ought to leave the Americans in peace. Oh, no, no. Oh, darling, please. I say no. Oh, Simon, please, don't make me speak severely to you. Severely? Well, truthfully, it's quite possible you've lost your ability to frighten people. Lost my ability to frighten people? Yes, dear. You are but a ghost of your former self. Just what do you mean? Well, I very much fear that that you're growing stale. And in the parlance of the day, why, you simply can't hack it anymore. Hack it? Not able to hack it? Me? Oh, Simon, come now. Were you not reduced to using brute force? You, who through all these centuries have prided yourself on the artistry of your hideous disguises. You failed to frighten a mere mortal. And Simon, an American at that. But he's a clod, altogether too stupid to have even a semblance of nerves. Is that thunder? I think so. It just occurs to me... I've always been at my best during a thunderstorm. <gasps> True enough. And tonight, to judge from that sky out there, will be a night of elemental fury. Oh. A perfect background for haunting. I shall outdo myself this night. I shall employ a disguise so horrible, so fiendish. Something guaranteed to drive the churl out of his skull. What? Ah, yes, yes, yes. That is the question. What, 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 what shall it be? Oh, I have every confidence that you, my sweet, my sweet, will create a costume that every ghost in England, in the world, would give his winding sheet to possess. Oh, you are too kind, altogether too kind. But let me think. Let... Ah. Oh. It? Yes, yes. You, my darling, have given me a thought. Winding sheets. That is the ticket. A winding sheet? Of course. I have an excellent one. Very old, very moldy. The one with the frilled cuffs <gasps> and neck. But of course, of course, do go on. I will wear that and take with me my rusty dagger. I shall approach the room moaning and groaning in a most gruesome fashion. When I enter it, I shall stand over them in the form of a green, icy, cold corpse till they're all but paralyzed with fear. And then, and then I shall cast off the winding sheet and crawl around the room with white, bleached bones and one rolling eyeball. Oh, Simon, dear, you you have outdone yourself. I dare say even you will agree I can still cut the mustard, my dear. Oh, you can, you have. What of the girl, the American's daughter? Oh, she, she must go in peace. I touch her not. Why so? Because, 
Well, my dear, you will scarcely believe this, but not only did I fail to frighten her, but she said... Well, she said she felt sorry for me. She said that? Yes, yes. And she looked at me when she said it with eyes... Well, Eleanor, her eyes were filled with sympathy and pity and... Yes, love. Oh, Simon... Could she be the golden girl? I should like to think so, but I fear not, my love. It's too much to ask. Much too much. But I must do work. The night approaches and the storm. I promise you, oh, I promise you, that within a few short hours I shall reduce the cold-blooded Hiram Otis... To a mindless mess. Why have you brought me here, Jeff? I've never seen this part of the castle before. It's a hidden passage, or it once was. As to why I brought you here, well, it seems to me every time I want to be alone with you, your your father shows up, or your mother, and... Oh, Ginny, I... I do want to talk to you. Yes? Ginny, marry me. But, Jeff, dear, I'm going to. You know that? No, I mean now. Tonight. Tonight? Yes, let's get in my car, drive to town, find a justice of the peace and get married. But, darling, we don't have a license. Oh, we'll get one. How? I don't know, but we will. I'll, I'll manage it somehow. Jeff, this is the United States, not England. Things are done differently here. And, and anyway, there's, there's no sense discussing it because I just... Can't go against my father's wishes. Oh, you don't have to be afraid of him. Afraid? Darling, I'm not afraid of him. I love him. I know what you think. That he's hard and domineering and ruthless and a lot of other things. But you know, inside, he's not that way at all. Mm, Perhaps not. Unfortunately, I only know him from the outside. But as time goes by, you'll learn to know him better. And you'll see... Jimmy, you're not a child. You're a woman. I need you, Ginny. I, I I want you. Jeff, please, please, darling. Je- no. Ginny, Ginny, oh, please. Jeff. <gasps> oh, blood! I must have blood. Oh no, not tonight, not now. And when I say blood, I don't mean a drop or two of blood. I mean gallons of blood. It's him. It's the ghost. Who else? Oh, to drive that churl Hiram Otis out of his mind. Oh. oh. Oh, agony! Oh. He went right by us. He never saw us. Yes, I know. Now, let's follow him and see what he's up to. Oh, horror. It is horror. Hark ye to the horrifying moans of the vampire monk. Oh. My parents' bedroom. He's gone in there. Hark ye to the horrifying moans of the vampire monk or the bloodless Benedictine Who's there? A vampire monk. See, I bend over you. A green, icy corpse. Watch as I crawl around the room with white bleached bones and one rolling eyeball. What are you doing on the floor? Huh? Oh, why, you're the ghost, aren't you? Please, now, could you be just a bit more quiet? My husband has had a very tiring day, and he needs a sleep. And you're certainly going to wake him up sooner or later with all that moaning and groaning. Well, I am a ghost. I'm haunting you. All right, all right, all right, but please do it quietly. Why you ride you? and ridicule me, would you? Oh, but please, you can understand. Pay screen. for it. I, woman, pay with thy heart's blood. You've seen your daughter for the last time on this earth. For the last time. Jeff. Jeff, he means me. No, darling, he can't. If he didn't see us following him. I have seen you. Huh? I saw you there in the secret passage, but was too busy with other matters to be bothered with you. I saw you following me. From the back of my head, I saw you. Stand aside, Jeffrey de Canterville. I take your beloved with me into the next world. Oh, no, you don't. I warn you. You're a Canterville, and I would do you no harm, but stand in my way, and I will place on you, as I already have on them, a Canterville curse. No. Oh, no. Oh, yes. 
Stand aside, I say. Stand aside. Wait. Yes? If you wish to take me into the next world, all right, go ahead. But leave Jeffrey alone. Leave my parents alone. Don't harm them. You would give your life for them? If I must. Ginny, no. Ginny. Oh, Ginny. Jeffrey. She's gone, vanished. Yes. What does it mean? Oh, good Lord, what does it mean? Uh, what? Well, 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 what does what mean? What, well, what's going on oh, here? Oh, Hiram, that ghost, that ghost, he's taken Ginny. He's taken her with him into the next world. Oh, come on now. It's the truth. In heaven's name, Mr. Otis, wake up to the truth. The ghost of Simon de Canterville has taken Ginny out of this world and into his own. And you'll never see her again. And I'll... And I'll never see her again. What the devil are you talking about? It's... It's the curse of the Cantervilles. The ghost placed the curse on you tonight. Oh, what lies ahead for you, Mr. Otis? Yeah? What does lie ahead for me? I can't even begin to tell you. And even if I could, I wouldn't dare. Strange sort of ghost, Sir Simon de Canterville. At one moment, he's almost gentle, tender. And the next, in a towering rage. He acts almost like us humans, doesn't he? And like us humans, he may have jumped from the frying pan into the fire in abducting Virginia Otis. We'll find out shortly when I return with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. I take you now down a short flight of wide stone steps somewhere in the nether regions of Canterville Castle. Steps stained by centuries of dampness. It is a place where rats and beetles might scuttle about in and among the bleached bones of a skeleton which lies on the stone floor. Poor skeleton. One of its hands, manacled, claws towards the remains of a bowl which once held food. A door opens. A light appears on the steps. And Sir Simon de Canterville sweeps down the steps, dragging Virginia Otis after him. He flings her to the floor. Here lie my bones. Here soon shall lie yours. He whips a dagger from a case at his side, stoops, grabs her by the hair, and holding her head back, makes as if to plunge the blade into her throat. But he stops short. How can you look at me like that? Are you not afraid? No. You face death, yet you're not afraid. Do I face death? Will you kill me? What is to prevent me? You killed once out of passion and have suffered nearly four centuries for it. Would you dare again? I would, I, I would. Well then, if I'm to die, I suppose I shall. Being afraid wouldn't help matters. But really, I'm not afraid. At least, not of you. (sighs) Eleanor was right. Eleanor? My wife. She says I don't seem to frighten anyone anymore, that I can't hack it anymore. Why do you want to? I'm a ghost. It's my only reason for existing. It's not a very good reason, if you ask me. It's no reason at all, if it comes to that. It's simply part of the punishment I must bear for murdering my wife. The Lady Eleanor? Yes. Why did you murder her? Jealousy? Unreasoning jealousy? I thought her in love with another man. I found out later how wrong I'd been. But it was too late then. I assure you my remorse was so great I hardly struggled at all when her brothers chained me in this dungeon and starved me to death. And that? That's your skeleton? Yes. Poor skeleton. Poor ghost. 
You must be very tired. As only a man who has not slept for nearly 400 years can be. But there'll be no rest for me, never any rest, until the legend of Canterville Castle is fulfilled. But I didn't know there was a legend. Jeff never told me. Oh, yes, yes. And when it is fulfilled, then... Why, then I shall sleep at last in the little garden far beyond the pine woods. What garden do you mean? The garden where the grass grows long and deep, where the hemlock flowers are like great white stars and the nightingale sings all night long. All night long he sings, and the cold crystal moon looks down, and the yew tree spreads its giant arms over the sleepers. The sleepers? Do you mean the garden of death? Yes, death. Would you help me if you could? If you could make the legend come true, would you? Yes. What is the legend? It is this. When a golden girl can win prayer from beyond the gates of sin, when the barren almond bears... And the girl gives away her tears. Then shall all the house be still. And peace come to Canterville. What? What does it mean? It means that you must weep with me for my sins. Because I have no tears. And pray with me for my soul because I have no faith. And then... And then, if you have always been sweet and good and gentle, that withered almond tree you have perhaps seen outside the library window... The barren almond tree, yes. That tree will bloom again to show... To show... Yes, to show... That the angel of death has had mercy on me. I should like to do that for you. I know. But you may fail. Yes. And if you fail, the torches of the damned will be yours through all eternity. You must dare to go beyond the gates of sin. You will see fearful shapes, hear wicked voices. If you are the golden girl of the legend, you will not be harmed. But if you're not the golden... I tremble for you. Well, what is your answer? I will do it. Think, think. Be sure. Oh, do be sure. I am sure. Then turn, turn, and behold the gates of sin. Shrink back. You are afraid. The shrieks. The laughter. Worse lies beyond the gates. Far worse. <gasps> ah, you are afraid. You are afraid. And I am doomed. No. You will go for me. You will go beyond the gates of sin. For you. For any other soul. And give me your hand. Let me kiss you. <gasps> your fingers are cold as I Oh, but your lips. Perhaps my lips, too, shall be cold if you are the golden girl. I pray God you are, for your sake more than mine. You must release my hand now, if I'm to go beyond the gate. Yes, yes, I know, only... Let go. Let go. Go. Virginia, come back, come back. Mr. Otis, there's nothing that can be done. Virginia's gone forever. Harold, 
It's all your fault. If we hadn't ridiculed the ghost, if we had just taken him seriously, all this would have been avoided. Uh, I got to admit you're right, Martha. But that doesn't help matters. All I want now is to get Ginny back. Safe and sound. <laughs> She's gone. Gone. I've been a fool. I I thought she might be the golden girl, the girl of the legend, and I let her go beyond the gates of sin. Oh, oh, no. If that be so, I am done with you, Simon. Oh, no, 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 not you. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. You are revolting enough to be human. I tried to stop her at the last moment. I tried... But it was too late. Too late. Too late. Simon. The nightingale. Eleanor. The nightingale. Oh. It sings. It sings in the garden of death. It sings. Oh. And the girl of Virginia. Oh, she succeeded. She must have. Simon, Simon, look. Virginia. Sir Simon. You've returned. From beyond the gates of sin, you've returned. Did you think I wouldn't? Yes, yes, I I thought that. I knew I would. I'd not have gone past those gates if I hadn't felt sure. Then you are the golden girl of the legend. You are the golden girl. Are you saved now? Oh, yes, child, yes. I'm saved. After all these centuries, released. And you're the one who did it. Eleanor, she is the one. What can I do to thank her? What? What? Oh, Simon, restore her to her own world. What else, dear? My watch is stopped. What time is it? It's nearly three in the morning. Three in the morning? I've got a nine o'clock committee breakfast. I... I... Oh, what am I saying? Business, business. It becomes a habit. My little girl is gone, but my first thought is if... Oh, God in your heaven, what kind of a man am I? Oh, Hiram, you're a good man. You just lost yourself in in making a living. Yes. Lost myself in making a living. Yeah. We spend too much of our lives making a living. We should spend more of it living. (laughs) I guess your ghost knows that, Jeff. I... Don't know whether he does or not. I do. What was that? I thought I heard... It sounded like Ginny's voice. Yes, I thought I heard it too. You did, Jeff. I'm back. I'm here. Ginny! Oh, my God. Ginny! Oh, Ginny! Oh, my baby! Oh, my baby! Where have you been? What happened to you? No, no, don't ask me. Don't ask me that ever. Yes, but Ginny... Daddy, I love you, but don't... Please don't. Not ever... Try to tell me what to do with my life, my soul, again. Let me do what I want to do, what God put me into the world to do. You... you sound strange. No, no, not strange. Truthful. I've seen what... what lies beyond, beyond this world, beyond us. And uh, we... We here on this earth, we think that we're the end of everything. And we're really only the beginning. Daddy. (laughs) Dad. And Mom. And you too, Jeff. There's so much out there that we don't understand. So much. Ginny, what did you see? What's that? Not a bird at this hour of the morning. It's a nightingale, Mother. Come. 
come to the window, I'm sure we'll see what I expect to see. Yes. There. Look. At what, Ginny? At what? The storm is over now. And the moon, a great white moon, sheds its light over the gardens. Look. The almond tree. The barren almond tree. Why, uh, it's blossomed. I can see the flowers in the moonlight. And that tree, it's part of the legend. For centuries it hasn't bloomed, and, and legend said it never would until... until peace came to Canterville. And peace has come. Far away, beyond the pine wood... There is a little garden. There the grass grows long and deep. There the hemlock flowers are like great white stars. And the nightingale sings all night long. All night long he sings. And the cold crystal moon looks down. And the yew tree spreads its giant arms over the sleepers. Jeffrey... Yes, Ginny. He's at peace, Jeffrey. The Canterville ghost is finally at peace. This story, this beautiful story, we owe to a man named Oscar Wilde. Perhaps some of you know the tragic details of the last years of his life. Well, no matter. What's important is what he wrote almost a hundred years ago. Wrote what entertained you in this past hour and perhaps enlightened you too. It is better to live than to make a living. I'll be back shortly. Oscar Wilde is buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery, just outside Paris. I visited his tomb, a tomb over which a sad angel with drooping wings weeps. And yes, I bowed my head, not so much in homage to the man as to the spirit within him, the spirit within all of us, our own private, very private Canterville ghost. Our cast included Arnold Moss, Marion Seldes, Mildred Clinton, William Redfield, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The answer's still the same. No dog, no baby. Just be happy with these dumb plants. They're bad enough. They have the whole bloody windows. I hate you. You're lucky I let you keep them. I hate you. I wish you were dead. What did you say? I said, I hate you. I wish you were dead. Did you really say... Hey. Hey, what? Hey, what? Oh. What's this? The bloody plants are on my neck. Oh. Hey, hey, Barbara, they're all around me. Mm. They're choking me. I can't get them off. Hey, Barbara. Barbara, they're too strong. Bart. Bart, 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 Barbara, don't stand there. Get them off. No. Get the scissors. Barbara, the scissors. I hate you. I hate you. I want you dead. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar Free Diet 7 Up and Sign Off, the Sinus Medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
I'm E.G. Marshall. For most of us, is there any more alluring form of minor masochism than the good old-fashioned ghost story? The icy fingers running shivering shocks up and down the spine, playing that fascinating dichotomy of, this might have been me, but, oh, thank the Lord it wasn't. So this ghost story begins with Joel and Jane Trent, early 20s, married eight months, starting out in life with a future unlimited, except the present unfortunate necessity of counting every penny to make life work and to live in some dignity and comfort. And then, the fabulous break, or what seemed the fabulous break, that marvelous ad in the classified section of the Sunday Chronicle. Joel, I found us a home. Are you listening? All ears. Eminently desirable, two bedrooms and bath for the right couple. Fully furnished sublet for at least two years. Please, not before 10 a.m. Sunday, H.S.M. Apollyon, 27 Southwest 62nd Street. So? So what? That's right off Central Park. It'd cost a fortune. I saved the best for the last... Rent, 200 a month. One month security. Oh, there's got to be something wrong with it. Why? It's too cheap. Well, does that mean we can't look at it? No, we'll be there on the dot, fighting the line. What have we got to lose? What indeed. And don't be afraid of a crowd. Yours is the only paper this ad will appear in. Because it's you I want. One advantage of being a rather special printer's devil. Our mystery drama, The Real Printer's Devil, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Paul Hecht and Jada Rowland. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and new sugar-free diet 7-Up. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Could there be a more mundane, run-of-the-mill beginning to a really haunting ghost story than two young people on the way early on a bright Saturday morning to answer an ad for a sublet furnished apartment? But such an apartment. From their point of view, a steal at the price, at the location, containing everything they ever wanted, a long-term lease, a promise of heaven. But from another point of view... Oh, well, that, as we shall see, is the hell of it. <laughs> the rooms will be small. So? How big are we? It'll be crawling with cockroaches. My best friend's uncle's cousin is an exterminator. It did say two bedrooms, didn't it? That's what it said. The second one is probably just a walk-in closet. So I'll build a fresh air duct to it. A crib doesn't take all that much floor space. Oh, hold it. What's the matter? The baby didn't... No, the baby didn't do anything. It's me. Oh, the way my tummy's revolving, it's lucky there aren't three of us here already instead of two. I'm scared. Of what? Look, 62nd Street. This is the corner. Supposing it really smells. Supposing the price was a misprint. Supposing the John's out in the hall. (gasps) Suppose someone got there first and took it. No way, no way. It isn't even 10 a.m. yet. Oh, never mind. Let's get going. What was the number? 15, 17? Uh, 27. There it is, on the other side of the street. Oh, it's an attractive building. Yeah. Hey, there's a nice little garden around the main door. And it looks so well kept up. Oh, Joel, it just seems too good to be true. Well, come on. Let's find his bell. Ah, here it is. H.S.M. Apollyon. That's our fairy godfather. Don't call him that. I don't care how gay he is. The apartment's all I care about. Press the bell. Okay. Be ready when he buzzes down. Yeah. Oh, why doesn't he answer? Maybe he's in that john down the hall. Oh, you... Enter, my love. Oh, I love the carpet. Bittersweet. I hope nothing I said hurt his feelings. Well, the elevator's waiting. Let's get it over with before I faint. 
I have a few butterflies myself. Got the floor number? Yeah. And we are off. Everything's so clean and efficient. Well taken care of. You sure it wasn't East 62nd? No, look, here, 27 West. I hope it's not too high up. What floor is it? Oh, forget it, darling. That's for later. <clears throat> well, here we are. Uh-huh. I thought I heard the lift. Uh, uh, my Anglican background, or I should say English elevator, I meant, of course. Are you here to see the flat? Uh, apartment, I mean, naturally. Uh, yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, I, I'm Joel Trent. Uh, this is my wife, Jane. H.S.M. Apollyon here. And won't you come in? You know, everyone always thinks I must be retired Navy or something. Uh, H.M.S., you know. His Majesty's ship, whatever. You, you know. <laughs> Only it isn't. It's H.S.M. Stands for something quite different, I assure you. And besides, I'm not one for water at all. Can't abide it. <laughs> well, this is the vestibule or the foyer or perhaps the hall, you'd call it. As you can see, it's very much like any other of its kind. Oh, not at all, Mr. Paul Yonitz. It's absolutely fabulous. Oh, well, not exactly, but how nice of you to say so. One does do quite a bit of traveling, and some of the things you see, particularly those from the East, are quite, uh, well, I won't say fabulous, unique, perhaps. Now, that Chris, for example, would you believe that it has both perfume and poison forged into the steel of its blade? And the sorcerer's cane, well, that's real hair, you know, the handle. Now, which would you like to do first? A cup of tea and get acquainted and then do the flat or the other way around? Oh, if, if you don't mind, I'm just dying to see the apartment. I mean, the flat. <laughs> then off we go. Oh, Oh, no. Uh, and by the by, before we do start, only because once before I did have mm, quite a disappointment after showing a, a rather peculiar individual the apartment some 19 years ago, this man went all the way through the apartment. He was uh, some sort of a minister, as I remember. And after deciding to take it, he changed his mind when he learned the number of the flat. You did notice it, didn't you? Joel knows it. I don't. What is it, Joel? It's uh, apartment D. On the 13th floor. Oh. Well, that's, that's just a silly superstition, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. Well, now, shall we, uh, shall we have a look about? Uh, do you take sugar with your tea, Mrs. Trent? One lump, please. But really... Mr. Trent, uh, or would you prefer something stronger? No, no, tea's just great. Uh, two. Uh, lumps, I mean. Uh, how about milk, Mrs. Trent? No, thanks. Neither of us. But really, Mr. Polly, and this is awfully kind of you, but we must be holding you up. I'm sure there'll be loads of other people in answer to your ad. Well, they're not here yet, so we can enjoy our tea, eh? <laughs> Besides, my dear, I have a sneaking suspicion that... Uh, oh, your cup, oh, Mr. Trent. That not so many people are going to turn up in answer to the ad. For a dream apartment like this, I can't believe that. I was surprised there wasn't a line a mile long. <laughs> well, how nice both of you are. You know, I've, I've really taken quite a fancy to you. That's very sweet of you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's so difficult today to find young people with all the good old-fashioned uh, virtues. <laughs> what am I saying? It's been very difficult for generations. So for my purpose, you, uh, you're you quite ideal. I, I, I don't quite understand. Oh, I thought I'd made myself quite clear. You're just the people I want in my apartment. That is, of course, if you're interested. And if there's anything I can do to make it more attractive to you... Attractive? I... Well, the whole place is just a dream. It's the sort of place Joel and I made up dreams about living in after saving everything we could make for the next 10 or 20 years. And now to think that... At a price we can afford, we can start living that way right now. Oh, dear me. Now, I didn't mean to upset her. <laughs> no, she's only crying because she's so happy, you see. you got to excuse her. It says in the book that women in her condition sort of... Uh-oh. Oh, Joel. Oh, I just slipped out, Jane. I... Women in... Uh... We just thought we'd have trouble finding something we could afford, and we, and we wanted to have plenty of time. 
Matt Gertrude's place in Mount Vernon just doesn't have room for all of us now, you, let alone... Why, well, you're going to have a baby. <laughs> well, now, isn't that nice? My congratulations. <laughs> it's a sort of a bonus, in a way. You mean you don't mind babies? Mind? I love them, just adore them. You you can't know how much extra pleasure they afford. Oh, gee, that's great. Uh, what did you mean, a sort of bonus? Oh, that. Uh, why, uh, to think of being able to use the crib and the baby bath and all those things I once bought for a tenant and his wife and baby who were unfortunately lost in a plane crash on the very day they were to move in. Oh, how awful. Yes, snatched away from me at the last moment. Oh, I, I don't mean that the way it sounds. You see, I'd grown almost as fond of them as I... Have a few. <laughs> now, we must get down to business. I'll um, have the bed taken out of the small bedroom and set up the crib for you. And uh, when could you move in? Why, the sooner the better. At your convenience, of course. Oh, if I told you my convenience, my dears, I'm sure I would shock you. <laughs> Try me. Well, today. This minute. This afternoon. If at all possible, not later than six o'clock. You shocked me. I know the ads had immediate occupancy, but I wasn't quite well, expecting it. Let me soon. explain. I had a tenant, you see, a most interesting man, a sort of a, a Billy Sunday, you might say. Fascinating challenge. Challenge? Oh, well, I shouldn't admit it, but I feel I know you both so well, even after the short acquaintance. Do you know, I've traveled a great deal, and I've never been able to resist the inordinately evil things that men have dreamed up as the centuries went rolling by. The grimoires, the, the devices of the Inquisition, our own New Englanders. Uh, well, I bought all sorts of quite horrible things. Pictures, instruments, statues, charms, and so forth. I keep them all hidden away in that big closet at the end of the hall. Oh, that's the only thing that's off limits, by the way. I keep it locked. Oh, that would be perfectly all right. There's plenty of other closet space. And you wouldn't be interested in this awful stuff anyway. <laughs> As I said, this man was a minister, so I, um, I thought I'd really give him a start. So, I replaced everything and hung up all this perfectly awful stuff. Oh, quite bone-chilling and terribly evil. But why? Well, I wanted to see his reaction, so I thought I'd scare him off. And naturally, you did. Good gracious, no, he loved it. <laughs> Couldn't wait to move in. <laughs> but someone greater than us solved the problem. Unfortunately, he was taken from us with uh, a heart attack. Oh, the poor man. Yes, actually, he never realized how fortunate he was. Oh, but I, I didn't mean to depress you. Let's get back to all the fun and practical things. Now, I have some urgent business in the Near East, and I've uh, booked an overnight plane for tonight. If I could possibly make that... Joel, there's no reason why not, is there? Uh, you have the money. Yeah. And we have the time to run up to Mount Vernon and back and get enough clothes to settle in. Then we could bring the rest later. Well, I, I, I guess it might be arranged. Uh, um, oh, by the way, what business are you in, Mr. Apollyon? Oh, that's uh, a little difficult to explain. Uh, rather like the import and export business. Oh, you deal in objet d'art? In a sense, yes, but perhaps a better word would be subjects. But to get back to our business, if you have the rent and the security with you, we'll exchange them for the keys and sign the leases, give you a thorough briefing on the entire apartment, and then I can be off just as soon as you return. Uh, oh, well, Mr. Joel... Oh, forgive me, but at my age, I think I can take the liberty to use your first name. I'm a rich old man with no children, and money is no object to me. Now, if the rent is too high... Two hundred dollars a month for a two-bedroom apartment furnished like a palace? Why, it's... Hush, 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 hush. Now, it's all I want from the right people. Besides, um... <coughs> Uh, there is one little catch to the whole thing. Oh, dear, I hope it won't prove too much of a problem. Oh, a catch? Yes, I, I'm afraid so. Are you by any chance afraid of cats, Jane? Cats? 
No, I love them. So does Joe. In fact, we've been thinking of getting one. Oh, well, now that is a relief. You have one. And such a cat. Pure Abyssinian and the delight of my life. He's the only reason I must always find just the right tenants. Can we meet him? Uh, he, he might not like oh, us. Oh, have no fear about that. Smokey, uh, that's his name. Smokey, he loves everyone. Well, where is he? I'm dying to see him. At the moment, he's at Le Chasseron, being attended with loving care by Pierre and Christophe, so he will look his very best for his new conquests. Conquests? You, my dear. Oh, I promise you he will win your heart and soul when you meet him on your return. <laughs> Well, what do you think? Oh, darling, it's marvelous. Just what we need. Yeah, and just what we can afford. We won't have to go tiptoeing around Aunt Gertrude's every night. We both won't have to take a subway and a bus for 45 minutes to get to work every day. We could even walk. Jane, Jane, darling, the whole wide world's our oyster. Don't you agree? Yes. Yeah, but something is bothering you. Oh, I know it's silly. It's just that... That 13. Oh. Why couldn't it have been 12 or 14 or any other number? Now, you're not going to let something silly like that bother you. You know how superstitious I am. I just have such a funny feeling. Maybe it's the number made it so cheap. Maybe we ought to be grateful. I sure hope we're going to be. I guess we're in it now. Jane, you and me just made the damnest deal in the world. If only Joel could know how prophetic those words are. If only all of us were a little less gullible, the devil might have a long, hard task that could even discourage him. And if only he'd just take the people who are going his way. Why is he driven to tempt and maneuver and triumph by winning the others by artifice and indirection? Is it because he was once an angel? And when Lucifer fell, in his own shame, he must drag the rest of the world into the pit with him? I'll return in a moment with Act Two. Warm night in Chicago, 79 degrees right now at Midway Airport, getting up to 93 for the day Thursday. In the fourth period of play, 22 to 22, Jacksonville and the Chicago Fire are tied up. Rocking in her chair, the bright hook flashing as she crocheted away at another rug, Aunt Gertrude found it hard to share completely in Joel and Jane's bubbling enthusiasm. Two reasons. One, she knew how large a gaping hole they would leave in her lonely life. And two, Aunt Gertrude was a pragmatist. You say only 200 a month for that apartment. Where shall I put my baseball spikes? Oh, Lord, do we have to take those? What did you say, Aunt Gertrude? Well, I just can't get over the price. It's it's a giveaway. I know. But we do have to take care of the cat. Oh, my, my. Such a chore. Open a can twice a day. Don't forget the litter pan. Now, don't change the subject. Tell me, what's wrong with the apartment, I wonder? There's something fishy. Andy, you had Bob Anderson go over the lease with a fine-tooth comb. And he's a real estate lawyer. Oh, I'm quite satisfied with all the legal aspects. It's just... I don't know, something else gives me a funny twinge in the left shoulder blade. Used to be a kind of storm warning. Well, now I guess it's just arthritis. Don't worry about us, Andy. And don't... Please don't have any doubts. Why, have you been having some... For the love of Mike, would you chew Cassandra's? Would you lay off? Here we have the break of a century. Oh, you're, and... you're quite right, Joel. I... I guess I'm getting so old that the milk of human kindness is beginning to sour. Now, I, I, I feel just like both of you. It is just, it's just too good to be true. And to be practical, it does solve all our problems. There really isn't room for the three of us in this tiny apartment of mine. And when the baby comes... It's like the clowns climbing into the midget car. Oh, yeah, well, I, I'm going to miss not being part of... Bringing up that baby, though. Oh, you'll have plenty of chance. I'm going to leave that bed in baby's room as well as the crib. 
Besides, there's a huge couch in the living room. There's the cab. Oh, brother, are we all packed? Yes. Well, I, I guess this is it. I'll take the heavy suitcase out first. Oh, it's going to seem strange with only one instead of three. At least we're not changing numbers. Hmm? Oh, well, the cat makes three. He's pretty special. He's an Abyssinian. Oh, what's that? Oh, they're gorgeous. Looks like a Siamese with blue, blue eyes and a lovely gray coat. Like the gray in, oh, in Chinchilla. Only shorter. His name is Smokey. Come on, Jane. He rustled the bustle. A chariot's waiting. Oh, wait a minute. I need the phone number. Uh, Jane, take a couple of the shopping bags out, will you, honey, while I write it down for Andy? Sure. Only how did you get the number? I, I forgot all about yeah, it. I took it off the bedroom phone. Oh, let me see. Uh, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three. Oh, my, that's a terrible number. Especially after apartment 13D. Janie doesn't know it yet. I want to break it to her slowly. Oh, <laughs> you superstitious people. Oh, I got a twinge in my shoulder blade now like I was bit by a horse. Who was bit by a horse? No one, dear. Come on, grab the rest of this gear before our impatient hacky runs out on us. Uh, come on, be right out. Oh, Jane, I'm going to miss you. Oh, me too. So will Joel. What the heck? It's not the last time we'll be seeing each other. Don't forget, we're having dinner Thursday night at the New Day. Oh, that reminds me. Just in case I forget the address, can I have your copy of the newspaper? Uh, yeah, well, oh, no, I left it downtown. Oh. Uh, don't worry, I, I picked you up a fresh copy. The ad is on page 37, column 5, a first one in furnished apartments. Uh -huh. Now, look, this really is goodbye. Let's go. Now, I'll worry about you. Promise me to call as yeah. soon as you're settled. Okay. Oh, it might be almost midnight. Oh, Come mind. on. Now, that's the last call. It sounds like the trump of doom. Oh, right. goodbye, Doug. Goodbye, Doug. Anchor. Hey, we'll call you. Don't right. worry. All right, dear. Oh, oh, I better get that address written down before I forget. Now, let's see. Page 37. Column 5. Oh, furnished apartments. Here, here we are. Oh, that's very strange. The, the ad isn't in this paper. There's no ad at all. Well, he didn't answer downstairs, and we have to let ourselves into the building. Maybe he's off getting old Smokey. Well, then I guess we should just use our keys and go right in. Well, that's what we paid the rent for. Uh, you want the honor? Oh, no, I'm terrified to let go of this bag with the eggs in it. You open the lock. Okay, here goes. Uh, well, I guess we need the bottom one, too. Uh, yeah. Mr. Apollyon? You try, you're louder. Uh, uh, Mr. Apollyon? <laughs> Oh, look. It must be Smokey. Hey, Smokey boy. Oh, isn't he cute? Rubbing himself against your leg, just as if he'd known you all your yeah. life. But where's Apollyon? Hey, you don't suppose that he's... Look at Smokey. He's backing off as if he was inviting you to come in. Uh, look, leave the rest of the gear here. You dump that stuff in the kitchen while I look through the rest of the house. Joel? Joel? Yeah, Jane, what is it? There's a note on the refrigerator door explaining everything. There's nothing to worry about. Oh, what happened? Darling, you know the oil shortage. They canceled the plane he was to leave on because of too few reservations, but offered him a seat on an earlier plane. Oh. <laughs> well, that's a relief. Yeah. What are you getting all head up about? I don't know, Jane. I just had a kind of nutty feeling. Of... I don't know what to call it. A death, I guess. I... I honestly thought I was going to find that nice old man lying somewhere with, with a heart attack or something. <laughs> yeah, I feel silly enough as it is. Now Smokey's laughing at me. Not him. It's explained on the very detailed note on the fridge. It's Smokey's din din time. Oh. He's hungry. Look what he gets. Ugh, looks like raw flesh. Well, whatever it is, you can see he loves it. That cat is losing its attraction for me. Oh, don't be a goon. Look how crazy you are for steak tartare. Well, that's different. You give him some mouthwash after he's through. Where are you going? I'm going to bring the rest of our stuff in. Great, just dump it in the bedroom. I'll sort it out later. Oh, that was a wonderful dinner. Oh, ought to be. Took long enough. What time is it? Uh, gee, I don't believe it. It's just midnight. Oh, it's been a long, glorious, 
wonderful, relaxing. What's that? I don't know. Joel, that was a shot. Oh, don't be silly. She walked out on him and shut the door. She? Or he, someone. Didn't old HSM give us a rundown on our neighbors? Let's see. According to the bulletin he left on the fridge door, upstairs, no problem. A very ancient hermit who winters in Florida and seems to estivate in summer? What's that mean? Oh, advantages of a classical education. If you sleep through the winter, you hibernate. If you sleep through the summer, you estivate from the Latin estivare. Well, I thought the Greeks always had a word for it. No, I'm pulling your leg. I have the faintest idea what it is. What's the poop on our other cliff dwellers? Uh, let's see. A, across the hall is a widow who just left on a round-the-world cruise. B, next door is a couple of swingers who never seem to be home at the same time. Yeah. And next door are two young kids he thinks we'll like who go to the movies and theater a lot. Okay, I'll blame the noise we heard on the swingers. Let's hope that's their last contribution for tonight. Well, we're forgetting the dishes tonight. Oh, good. We're going to bed and pull the covers over our heads. It mightn't be a bad idea. Okay, let's go. Well, what are we standing here for? We are not just standing. I have my arms around you, and I'm loving you, and I'm wondering if maybe I was just the most trusting, gullible dum-dum in the world, and maybe you should fetch me a smart karate chop to the left temple. What are you talking about, my darling idiot? I'm just wishing your darling idiot hadn't taken all our dough and paid it out in cash for security and the first month's rent. How's the bed? Like floating on air. Then look a little happier. I'm just remembering I forgot to call Aunt Gertrude. Well, you can't call her now. It's after one o'clock. Hey, where are my pajamas? In the old beat-up case on top. Toilet stuff, too. Oh, but before you do that, could you do me a favor? Sure. I forgot my calcium pill. It's with all the vitamins in the kitchen. Okay, I'll be right back. Oh, Lord. Please don't let me have made a terrible mistake. I loved this apartment so at first, but now... I... Joel? Who? Who's that? No. Please. Oh! Oh, Smokey. Oh, what a start you gave me jumping on the bed like that. Oh, you mad at me. Why are you looking at me like that? Did I forget to say goodnight? What is it? You want me to come somewhere? Oh, maybe I should have given you some milk. All right. We'll take care of it. No, the kitchen's that way. Not... Where is it you want to go? Joel, come here. I'll be right there. What is it, honey? It's Smokey, look at him. He came and got me and led me here. And he seems desperate to get into this closet. And that's the one Apollyon has all his little ghoulish treasures tucked away in. We couldn't open it anyway. It's, it's locked. Try it, just in case. Oh, there may be something of Smokey's that got locked in there by accident. Okay, here goes. Oh. Oh, how terrible. How terrible. And vicious. And unspeakable. And vile. Oh, no wonder that man. Oh, Joel, close it up. Oh, just shut away that horror. Oh, for God's sake, take me to bed and help me forget I ever saw it. Okay, honey, uh, what, what about Smokey? Whatever it was, he found it and ran. Close that door up. Shut it. Oh, I wish I could think I'll ever be able to shut it out of my mind. No wonder I thought this was all too good to be true. Good to be true? Better to interpolate and make it read, Too true to be good. Poor Jane and Joel. But how were such simple, ordinary people to know the language of black magic? Or that H.S.M. Mapollion is only a synonym for the more familiar and deadly spirit we usually call the devil? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. The Chicago Fire won tonight here at Soldier Field, beating Jacksonville 25 to 22. A short and classic definition of tragedy is the downfall of a noble person 
whose character is flawed by a single weakness which causes him to break a moral law which leads to his destruction. But how much more tragic is the destruction of the innocent, particularly when they happen to cross the path of someone who makes their disaster equally inevitable? Which brings us back to Joel and Jane Trent. Jane? Yes, darling? You stopped shaking? You think you can sleep now? I'm sorry I was so... so childish before. I think it's because I'm carrying one. <laughs> no, you aren't childish. I'm just the same. I've, I ain't got the willies, too. I guess it's just because it's all so strange to us. I think so, too. Well, let's get a good night's sleep, like everyone else has had. Good Lord, what was that? I don't know. It's from upstairs. It must be the old man. What's happened to him? I don't know. Just pay it no attention. Pay it no attention? No one could sleep with that noise going on. I'm going to go up and tell him to stop. Oh, no, please. Don't do that. Please don't go up there. Well, why not? Are you going to be ill? No, it... It's that up there. You mean our noisy neighbor. I'm... I'm scared, Joe. Yeah. I've had about all I can take, and that noise is really driving me up the wall. Yeah, me too. I, I know what I'll do. I'll call the superintendent. Uh, got his number on the sheet? No. Uh, Wouldn't you know it's the one thing he left off? It's just his apartment number, 1A. Oh, yeah. Look, I'll take a run down in the elevator and get him to come back up and see what's going on up there. Will you be all right alone? Yes. No. Oh, Joel, I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm not usually like this. I don't know what's got into me. I do. What? My son and heir. Oh, you male chauvinist. Just because she's carrying a baby doesn't mean a woman has to act like one. I'm sorry. I know. Look, I'll tell you what. I'll just take the elevator up there and I'll find out what's going on myself. Oh, no, you don't. You don't know what you'd be getting into. Go get the super. His name is Bill Josephs. Oh. 1A. All right. Okay. I gotta stop that somehow. Oh, well, here's your protector standing guard by the door. Go on in, Smokey. Keep Mrs. Trent company. I'll be right back. racket up there doesn't turn you a hair, Smokey. <coughs> then you're a male cat, so I suppose that makes us totally different breeds. Joel? Yeah, Jane, it's just me. Would you believe it? That damn elevator's out of order. I rang and rang. It just stays in the first floor. That damn racket's still going on. Yep. Only one it doesn't bother is old Smokey here. Joel, are there fire stairs? Yeah, but I'm not going down any 13 flights just to find a locked door. All the doors, even ours, have a safety lock on them. What are we going to do? Well, first off, I'm going upstairs to tell Barnacle Bill, or whatever his name is... Uh, uh, uh it's uh, Nemo. Oh, like, like Captain Nemo in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? I guess. Okay, I'm going to tell Nemo to up anchor and get out of range. Joel, don't get into any fights. With a guy old enough to be my great-grandfather? Yeah, it's okay. It's me, Jane. Half a sec. Joel? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. Well, what did he say when you got him to open the door? What was he doing? I... I don't know. He didn't open the door. Why? Look, I... I don't know how to tell you this, Jane. Well, just tell me anyway, but tell me. What is it? Well, I, I took some newspaper with me to wedge a door so I wouldn't get trapped. I fixed ours. Then when I got to the top of the stairs, it was a different kind of door. Well, what do you mean, different? Well, it was, you know, one of those heavy steel fire doors with a big heavy strap bars that you slide home. But why would 14 have a different kind of door from ours? Because... Oh, well, look, Jane, darling, maybe I, I, I just try to try to skip the... Well, you better not, or I don't know what might happen to... Well, all right, all right, take it easy. Just hang on, because I'm going to have to give you a real rocker. Let me have it. It's a different kind of door, because there isn't any 14th floor at all, or 15th, or 20. All that's over us is the roof. <laughs> you've been giving me. Oh, Brandy, I had a good jolt myself. The sound, it's still there. That's right. What causes it? Something 
loose up there on the roof. No, I searched it thoroughly. It, it's not coming from the roof. Then where? The neighbors? I checked that out. Whatever other lies Mr. Apollyon told us, there isn't anyone in any of the apartments on this floor. I've done everything but break down the doors to make sure. Then what are we going to do? I, I can't take this all night, Joel. Nobody could. I am going to call the police. I don't know what we've gotten ourselves into, but we are now getting out. Oh, I'm afraid it's a little too late for that, Mr. Trent. Apollyon, where the devil are you? Sitting right in front of you. In his other form. Smokey. I should have known from the beginning, from his eyes. Shine a strong light in a cat's eyes, and what happens? The pupil closes up. Into a long, narrow slit. But in a human being? It closes into a tight, round, dark circle. Like Mr. Smokey. Look as the lamp shines in his eyes. Yes, very observant, Jane. I should have been more careful. But since the illusion serves no function anymore, I might as well resume my father Christmas skies. hmm? Normally, I wouldn't have had to return to it except for you. Why not? Oh, people act in so many strange degrees. Some just go to sleep no matter how strange the noise is. Some trap themselves between floors. Some very hysterical ones try to leap from roof to roof. Some break through the neighbor's doors and meet quite unexpected deaths since there's nothing but space beyond them. And some sit awake all night not realizing that morning will never come again. And some are... uh, a little troublesome. But none escape? Well, it wouldn't be very good for my reputation, would it? Who are you? Oh, Jane, you tease me about my classical education. Little good it served me. Apollyon, of course. A synonym for the devil. And the HSM? His satanic majesty, I presume? We all have our little conceits. Well, this time... Maybe we can take that conceit down a peg or two. Not with the phone. It's not connected. As a matter of fact, it doesn't really exist. Listen. Now what? Well, if you will forgive the devil quoting scripture, or to be more exact, the book of uh, common prayer, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. You'd kill us? Oh, my dear, as attractive as they are, I have no interest in your corporeal presences. The soul is all I'm after. Oh, you won't get ours without a fight. (laughs) There was no pain, my dear. You killed him. But you won't get me. Jane, it's too late. The contract is made. The elevator. The elevator. (laughs) No, don't step in there. The car is... (laughs) Now, why didn't she wait for me to tell her the car was still on the first floor? Poor, crushed little sparrow. But what matter the bodies live and die in in the blink of time's eyelid? The soul is what lives forever. No time to waste philosophizing. Tomorrow is another equally busy day. A quick general cleanup, and then the ad must be sneaked into that one right paper so the Smithers will get it. (laughs) I wonder what the New York Chronicle would have to say if they knew that they had a real printer's devil. Yeah. Oh, look, my name is Gertrude Conway, and, and my niece and her husband are renting Mr. Apollyon's apartment. Now, I've been trying to call them ever since last Lady, night, and Lady, I, just a I moment, have no, now I, not I just, only been informed by the telephone company that there is no such number, but that there could be no such number. Also, Jane, my niece, she promised to call me if I didn't call her, and yeah. even if she thought last night was too late, she would have called this morning. Yeah. You see, she's going to have a baby. Oh, well, then, maybe she went to a hospital. In the middle of her second trimester... Huh? The baby is less than five months old. Oh. 
Still, you know, she might. Anyway, now, I've checked with all the hospitals and she has not been admitted. Now, I'm worried something may have happened. I, I want you, please, to, to take me up to the apartment with the keys. Oh, what apartment? Mr. H.S. M. Apollyon, who sublet it to them. Lady, we ain't got no Mr. Apollyon on it or whatever his name is in this building. Oh, certainly you have. This is 27 Southwest 62nd Street, isn't it? You sure, that's right. Oh, very well. It's apartment 13D. 13D? That's right. Well, that solves the whole problem. Oh, good. There ain't no apartment 13D in this building. What? Point of fact, lady, there ain't no 13th floor. You know, like most New York buildings. We go from 12 to 14 and then right off up to, 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 to 30. Are you sure? Look, I've been running this building for 22 years. Oh, my God. I have this terrible feeling there's something awfully wrong. Nothing unusual happened around this building last night or in the neighborhood. No, no, quiet as a church, ma'am. Not even a mugging. And believe me, I get all the word when Officer Strauss drops in for his morning coffee. But two healthy young people can't just disappear into thin air. George? Uh, 13. Good thing we ain't either of us superstitious, huh? Yeah, not at this rent. Look out for the catch, huh? Don't worry. You just trust me. Aha! I thought I heard the lift. Uh, my Anglican background, I should really say English, actually. Elevator, I meant, of course. Are you here to see the flat? Uh, uh, apartment, I mean. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm George Smithers, and, uh, this is my wife, Violet. Ah, H.S. Amapolion here. Everyone always thinks I'm Navy, but I'm not. It isn't H.M.S., you see. H.S.M. stands for something quite different. Oh, yeah. Well, do come along in. I'm sure you're dying to see the apartment, and I... I can promise you... I won't disappoint you. Two more sacrificial lambs to the slaughter. Their doom, of course, is sealed. But, as Mr. Joseph says, so many people disappear in a big city every day. Not quite in this way, of course. But I suppose you can never be too careful. The sad trouble is that, as Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, the devil is most devilish when respectable. I'll be back shortly. Caveat emptor, the Latin phrase which says, let the buyer beware. This is true of all advertisements, of course. And the tighter the economy gets, the more the buyer should beware. But we wouldn't want to suggest you need fear the kind of ad we have featured tonight. In the beginning, we promised you a spine-tingling ghost story, which featured the two phrases, too good to be true, and too true to be good. As a good night, we'd just like to suggest it was all in fun. And even if it wasn't true, we hope you found it good. Our cast included Jada Rowland, Paul Hecht, Ian Martin, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. We've been married for 20 yes, years, yes. happily married. But you can't throw years away like old shoes. Destroy everything we've built together. Everything we've come to mean to each other. I'm powerless to do anything else. Well, I am not. What do you mean? I mean that you're suffering from some sort of... some sort of aberration. You're sick, Norman. Mentally sick. And I am not letting you do anything as stupid, as disastrous as marrying that girl. I will not divorce you, Norman. Agnes. No, Norman. In a few months, it'll all be over. This sudden romance of yours will be dead. Stone cold dead. No. In a few months, I will be stone cold dead. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division, 
and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of the uncanny, the eerie, the unearthly. Strange things happen. They have happened to me and will again. They have happened to you and will again. They happened to Norman Meredith, but they will never, never happen to him again. Because, well, listen. Listen. you ask, Norman? Don't you know me? How would I know you? We've never met. Oh, yes, we have. Mm -hmm. Norman, dearest heart, Mm -hmm. I am the woman of your dreams. (laughs) Your dream woman. (laughs) Well, why... Why do you hold that knife? That long, sharp carving knife... To kill you, Norman. To kill you. Our mystery drama, The Dream Woman, is based on the classic by Wilkie Collins and was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sign Off, the Sinus Medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. What is a dream? From where does it come? And why? Why? Wiser men than I say that dreams rise like mist out of various levels of the subconscious and the unconscious. But what is the subconscious? What is the unconscious? No one really knows. Oh, there are theories, yes. But no one can say with certainty why we dream. Why, for instance, Norman Meredith dreamed that certain dream. You say, you say you're the woman of my dreams, my dream woman. If that's so, why would you want to kill me with that knife? So you can stay in my world always. Be mine always. No, I don't understand. Only when you are dead, physically dead, can your spirit live, really live. And you come from the spirit world? A spirit world. One of countless spirit worlds. Oh, join me in it now, dearest Norman. Dearest heart. Join me now. No! Yes! No! Yes! No! Yes! Norman! Yes! Norman. I must kill you, Norman. I don't. kill you, Norman. No, no, stop me. Please don't. I, I, die, Norman. I, I, die, Norman. I can't die, Norman. Die, Norman. 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 Norman, wake up. Wake up, Norman. Oh. Norman, darling, you've been having a dream. A, a oh. nightmare. Oh. <laughs> Agnes. Agnes, it's you. Of course, dear. Oh. Now relax. Oh, that woman. Horrible. That murderous, murderous woman with a knife. A dream, sweetheart. Nothing but a terrible dream. No. Now, Norman. I saw her so clearly. Her and the knife. 
A long carving knife, razor sharp, gleaming, and she struck at me with it. Struck and struck and struck. Oh, no, man. I saw it all. I saw it all clearly, vividly. She was tall, long blonde hair that fell below her shoulders, a voluptuous figure, and her eyes... Light blue, hazel eyes flecked with green. Oh, heaven help me, I'll never, never be able to get her out of my mind. Oh, she and that knife. Well, now, Norman, I can tell you this. As a psychiatrist, I have a number of patients who are troubled with nightmares, often with the same recurring nightmare, but... <laughs> They never come true, Norman. And neither will yours. No, no. What about that feeling? How do you explain that feeling that the woman last night, in that dream last night, seems as real to me today as she did then? That's why, even though I know how terribly busy you are, I had to see you today. She stays there. She she won't leave my head. Never too busy to fit an old friend into my schedule, but then... Oh, me, me, excuse me. Yes, nurse? Uh, uh, tell Miss Lawrence I won't be more than another five minutes. And I see, where was I? Oh, yes. I was about to say, I'm all but positive you won't have this dream again, Norman. Frankly, I think you've been driving yourself too hard. All right, now what's the meaning of this, Dr. Gerst? Miss Lawrence. You have kept me waiting more than 20 minutes. I'm sorry, Miss Lawrence. You're sorry. You... I've got a hairdresser appointment at three, and you're sorry? Look, Buster, you may be the great psychiatrist, Dr. Arnold Gerstein, but I am Sandy Lawrence, and nobody pushes me around, but okay? nobody's pushing you around, Miss Lawrence. You don't call making me wait 20 minutes pushing me no, around? No, no. Not when an emergency comes up. He the emergency? Uh, Miss Lawrence, if you'll just be patient another minute oh, or so. Oh, all right, all right, another minute, but no more, you understand? And I mean it. What's the matter with him? Why is he staring at me like that? Hey, what's with you, Buster? Give me the will. I... You... Uh, one minute longer, Miss Lawrence. I won't be more than another minute. What is with you, Norman? You were staring at Miss Lawrence as if... as if she'd shocked you. Who is she, Arnold? Her name is Sandra Lawrence. What does she do? Well, she claims to be an actress, but I don't think that's quite the profession she's in. Uh, why were you staring at her like that? Didn't you notice? Notice what? Tall, sexy, long blonde hair, hazel eyes flecked with green. Oh, yes, yes. She resembles the woman you saw no, in your dream. No, 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 not resembles, Arnold. She is the woman in my dream. Yeah? Uh, my name is Norman Meredith, Miss Lawrence. So? Uh, well, I was wondering if I might uh, talk with you for a few minutes. Well, about uh, what? Are you selling something? No, 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 no. I'm not a salesman. Nothing like that. I Could I come in? Well, I don't know. Uh, somebody give you my name? A client of mine? Well, I'm a friend of Dr. Gersten's. I, I saw you in his office this afternoon. Oh, hey, you're... You're the character that kept staring at me. I apologize for that. It was it was very rude of me. Yeah, well, that's okay. I mean, lots of guys stare at me. <laughs> Could I? Yeah, sure. Come on in. I, uh, I followed you after you left Arnold's, uh, Dr. Gerson's office. You followed me? Mm, yes. Yes. Hey. <laughs> you got it bad. Unless you got some other reason for playing Bloodhound. Uh, how about a drink first, huh? First. <laughs> oh, well, if you got it that bad. No, 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 no. I, I, I don't think you understand. I want to talk to you. Talk to me. Well, if that's the way you get your kicks. Tell me about yourself, Miss Lawrence. You know, tell me all about yourself. <laughs> You're real flaky. You just want to talk? I want to know all about you. All about you, who you are, where you come from, what you do for a living. Oh, come on, you must be kidding. What I do for a living? Mm. <laughs> hey, Norman, you put me away, you really do. Dr. Gersten said you're an actress? Uh, yeah, yeah, you could put it that way. 
I put on a real good act. If you mean what I think you mean... Well, what else would I mean? I mean, you can't be as square as you sound. Or can you? Look, will you stop staring at me like that? I really don't like being stared I'm sorry, at. I'm sorry. I, 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 I can't help myself. You fascinate me. Miss Lawrence. As Sandy, that uh, for Sandra. Sandra? I dreamed of you last night. Uh-huh. Well, lots of guys do. Men who've never met you. Well, okay, so you dreamed of me last night. I mean, you know, what do you want, an Academy Award? <laughs> No, I, I I want to get to know you better. <laughs> Come on, Normie, what's the angle, huh? No angle. I I I told you, you uh, you fascinate me. Look, Normie, you level with me. You level with me right now, or just blow, okay? I am leveling with you. When I say you fascinate me, I mean, well, there was the dream to begin with, and then meeting you, a dream woman in the flesh in Gerson's office. There's there's something so strange about it, about it. And you. Oh, now, I'm strange. No, it's more than that. It's, 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 it's you. I, I'm drawn to you. Waiting for you outside the medical center. I kept telling myself I was crazy. Yeah, and that you I would are. just put you out of my mind, go about my business. But I couldn't do it. All the time that I was following you, waiting for you, I didn't want to. I didn't want to. But I had to. I had to. You see, I was incapable of doing anything else. It must be like... Being an alcoholic or a drug addict, it's a compulsion. I i have to be with you. Well, whatever you got, you sure got it bad. Now, Normie, dearest heart, my time is valuable. It's $50 an hour. Dearest heart. Hmm? Dearest heart. You called me that in the dream, dearest heart. Oh, yeah? Oh, how about that? How about the 50 bucks? <laughs> well, sure. Okay, in advance. Oh. Oh, sure. Anything you say? Uh, Sandy? Here. Uh, put it on the table, Normie. boy. Okay. What'll we talk about? <laughs> I don't know. Anything. Anything, as I said. I, I want to know all about you. Tell me about yourself. Okay, uh, but, uh, how's about I slip into something more comfortable first, hmm? All right. You fix yourself a drink. The bar's over there. Thanks. You got any scotch? Yeah, try the shelf under the bar. Okay. Oh. Good Lord. What's the matter? This knife. This carving knife. Where did you get it? How do I know? I had it for years. Oh, you, you fascinated by knives, too? No. No, not knives. A knife. This one. <laughs> well, I said it before and I'll say it again, Normie. You put me away. Divorce. You want a divorce, Norman? Yes, Agnes, I do. To marry this tramp? Yes. I, I can't really believe you're saying this, I can understand you're being fascinated by a woman who resembles the woman you saw in your dream. She is the woman in my dream. I'm in love with her, Agnes. In love? With the kind of woman you tell me she is? Hmm? Norman, in love? Hopelessly, helplessly, compulsively. I'm, I'm gripped by something out of my control. I've tried to fight it, to free myself of it, and I can't. Agnes, I can't. But my darling, you've got to. I love you. Yes, and you love me. I know you do. Yes. We've been married for 20 years. Happily married. You can't throw years away like old shoes. Destroy everything we've built together. Everything we've come to mean to each other. I'm powerless to do anything else. Well, I am not. What do you mean? I mean that you're suffering from some sort of... Some sort of aberration... You're sick, Norman. Mentally sick. And I am not letting you do anything as stupid, as disastrous as marrying that girl. I will not divorce you, Norman. Agnes. No, Norman. In a few months, it'll all be over. 
this sudden romance of yours will be dead. Stone cold dead. No. In a few months, I will be stone cold dead. There are, we are told, dreams of precognition. Dreams which foretell events that will happen in the future. There are, in fact, many such cases on record. Explain them? I can't. The truth is, no one can. Not even Norman Meredith. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. asked, what is a dream? And come up with anything but a satisfactory answer. We might ask now, what is a compulsion? And find the answer equally unsatisfactory. A compulsion is, of course, the doing of something in spite of yourself. The doing of it against all the dictates of intelligence, reason, sanity. And that is precisely what Norman Meredith, well-to-do stockbroker, finds himself doing in the suite of a palatial hotel in Rome, Italy, close on to four o'clock of a summer morning. What am I doing here? Four o'clock in the morning in a Roman hotel, walking up and down, pacing the floor and talking to myself. Talking to myself like some kind of nut. Some kind of... Ah, oh, the prodigal returns. Oh, Still awake, Normie? That's right. I haven't been to sleep. Where have you been, Sandy? And that package, what's that package? Oh, a little item I picked up in the flea market around 2 this a.m. Flea markets aren't open at 2 in the morning. Well, they are if you know the right people. Huh? And what creeping things have you been running all over Rome with this time? Answer me, Sandy. Oh, Normie, flake off. I don't have to answer you about it. Oh, anything. yes, you do. No, 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 you don't. I have no hold on you. We're not married. You still have no hold on me, married or not. <laughs> true enough, I guess, true enough. So anytime you want out, Normie, you just say so. Anytime you've had enough of me. Oh, I'll never have enough of you, and you know it, damn you, you know it. Oh, how do you know it, Sandy? Normie, come on. We're not going to hash that all over again, are we? Not at four o'clock in the morning. I'm deadbeat. Uh, Look, I'm, I'm going to go to bed. You? No. No, 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 no. I'm not sleeping. When are you ever? You know something, Normie? I don't think you sleep more than an hour or two in 24. Mm. What are you, an insomniac or something? Are you afraid of... the dream? The dream. Yeah, the one you had about me. No. Oh, I'm not afraid. Why should I be? I don't know, except you never told me what it was. And you're scared to death. Doc, of what, of what, for Pete's sake? Me. You? Would I, would I be here in Rome with you if I was scared of you? Would I have taken you all over Europe these past few weeks if I was scared of you? Oh, not me. Not, not scared of me in the flesh, me in the dream. Come on, Normie, what happened in the dream? What did I do? Go to bed, Sandy. Okay. But that must have been some dream. Oh, hey! Let me show you what I picked up in the flea market. I'm not interested in flea market junk, Sandy. This isn't junk. Mm. It's got some kind of royal crest on the handle, and Milo said he's the one of the guys I was with. He knows steel, and he said the steel in this knife was the best Toledo uh. money could buy. Hey, Norman. Uh. What's the matter? You're white as a corpse. Why? Why did you buy that knife? I saw it. I liked it. Why? Why did you like it? What's wrong with me wanting a carving everything, knife? Everything, everything. There's everything wrong with you wanting a knife, a carving knife. What do you need with one? Do you cook? No. Are you even ever in the kitchen? No. So what do you want with a carving knife? You want to know the truth? I've been sort of thinking of taking up cooking, maybe, okay? You? You learn to cook? You can't boil water. All right, Normie. You don't have to rub it in. Look... I just thought 
You're really a nice guy. You're square, but you're nice. And I know I've been giving you a hard time. I mean, I'm out on the town all hours of the night living it up and... Well, we'll be leaving for Paris tomorrow, and they've got a real out-of-sight cooking school there, and I thought if if I could just make things up to you... Ah, what do you care? Uh, oh, I care. I care. I care a lot. If you're saying that you're thinking of maybe settling down, of acting like a wife when we're married, that is, and don't worry, Agnes will give me a divorce. Well, if that's what you've got in mind, I care. Is... Is that what you're thinking? I guess so. Yeah. I guess that's it. What else would have made me decide to learn to cook? What else would have made me buy this knife? Sandy, will you snap it up? I'm We've trying. got less than 40 minutes to make the plane to Paris. I'm trying to find that knife. Knife? What knife? The carving knife, the one I picked up last night at the flea market. I left it right here on the table when I went to bed, and now it's gone. Forget it. Forget it. I'll get you another. It's got to be here somewhere. You didn't take it, no, did you? me. What would I want with a carving knife? You're the one who's going to take the cooking lessons. Well, if you didn't take it, where could it have got to? I don't know, and I don't care. Now, come on, or we'll miss that plane. <laughs> usual, Arnold? Hmm? Oh, yes, thanks, Agnes. The scotch and water is easy on the scotch. Right. Arnold, you're a psychiatrist. What's wrong with Norman? What's happened to him? Why is he so fascinated by this cheap, common tramp? I can't answer that. No doctor could. Without at least months of investigation of talks with Norman of treatments... But you must have some theory. I don't. Some things that happen in this world are beyond us, beyond our understanding. Now consider, Norman had a dream in which a woman tried to stab him to death. The next day, he meets in the flesh the self-same woman of that dream. So he said. Norman is no fool, Agnes. He meets this woman who tried to kill him in his dream and is irresistibly drawn to her. Now, is Norman mad? He is not. What, then, is the answer to all this? Who are you? How can you ask, Norman? Don't you know me? How would I know you? We've never met. Oh, yes, we have. I'm Norman. Mm. Dearest heart, I am the woman of your dreams. Mm. Your dream woman. Why, why do you hold that knife, that long, sharp carving knife? To kill you, Norman. Mm. To kill you. Oh, why would you want to kill me with that knife? So you can stay in my world always. Be mine always. Uh, I don't understand. Oh, dearest heart. Join me. Now! No! Yes! No! No! Yes! No. yes. Don't stop. Yes! Don't stop. Yes. The knife. Don't die, die, Marvin. I can't die. escape the knife. Die! No! You die. There. I've got the knife away from you. Now... You die. Norman. Huh? Norman, huh? stop it. Die. Stop it. Die, Jeremy. Norman, you're crazy. Die. You're going crazy. Die. Norman. What? 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 Sandy. What are you, on acid or something? You're having a bad trip. Oh, no, no. You know better than to ask. Where am I? What happened? We're in Paris. We're in Paris, Paris. France. We've been here for a week. Yes. It's 2.30 in the morning, and you've been having a nightmare. And, boy, you nearly killed me. Oh, no. Oh, no. yeah. Look at me. You've ripped my gown. Gown. I'm in pajamas. You're wearing a gown. I just got in. Came into the bedroom, and there you were moaning and tossing. I I tried to wake you up, and you, 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 you attacked me. You grabbed me. You kept trying to... Look like you were trying to stab me. You... You said you'd be home early. You said you wanted to be rested fresh for tomorrow's ceremony at the Curtain Rouge Cooking School. Yeah, well, the people I was with, they, they decided to make a night of it, you know? In fact, uh, they're still at it. Me, I broke away, so you see, I, I am home early, Normie. Then stop calling me that. I've asked you a dozen times, stop calling me Normie. I'm sorry. Honest, I am. 
Norman. I don't know what it is with me. I mean, I try. I really try to be the way you want me to be, but I don't know what it is. And it's funny, because at first I didn't care what you thought, how you felt, but being with you all these weeks, you're really smooth, Norman. You really are. And I'd like to be more than I am for your sake, but there's just something in me. I just can't, can't control it. You too. What do you mean, me too? No, you can't help yourself. I can't help myself. We're in the same boat, Sandy, and I have the feeling it's just begun to sink. Alors, please demandez votre attention, mesdames et messieurs, s'il vous plaît. Ah, merci. Uh, today, as the maître of this particular class in cooking here at Le Cordon Rouge, it is, uh, as you know, my pleasure to award prizes to the three best students. I'm delighted to see that Monsieur Norman Meredith has accompanied the beautiful Sandra Lawrence today, because to her goes the first prize. Oh. Oh. <laughs> come, come oh. forward, Sandy. Venez ici, hein? And accept your award. Avec mes compliments, chérie. Oh, thank you, your maître. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, shall I open it so everybody can see what it is? <laughs> yes, but of course. <laughs> okay. Oh, hey. It's a knife. A beautiful carving knife. Uh, with, uh, take notice, Sherry, the name Le Cordon Rouge inscribed on the handle and your own name oh. on the blade. Monsieur Meredith, are you not proud of Miss Lawrence? You... Uh, Monsieur Meredith, uh, hey, Norman. are you ill? Mm, Norman? No, I just, I just need some fresh air. Excuse me. <laughs> You heard me, Normie. Where is the knife? How do I know? Now, you listen to me. Mm. The first time I met you, when you came to my place in New York, you acted real funny when you found that carving knife on the bar, you remember? And somehow I never saw that knife again. It just disappeared. Because you took it. You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I don't? No. Then what happened to the carving knife I picked up at the flea market in Rome? I know I left it on that table when I went to bed that night, and it wasn't there when I got up, and somehow it disappeared forever. Just why you're accusing me? Because you took them and you hid them, or you threw them away, or you did something, and you've done the same thing with my Cornar Rouge knife. Not me. Then where is it? Now, you took the knife, Normie. You've taken them all. I don't care about the other two. But this one, it means something to me. So you won first prize in a cooking class. What's the big deal? You can say that to me. Listen, I went to that class so I could learn to cook for you. Not for me. Oh, and I succeeded. God. I won first prize. Me, Sandy Lawrence, first prize. I don't care about the knife. I care about what it stands for. And it stands for the fact that... But I'm falling in love with you, Norman. Oh, Sandy. Sandy, baby. I don't Sandy, baby me. I want my knife. Now, where is it? What have you done with it? I threw it away, Sandy. Where? In the river, in the sand. Then it's gone. I'm afraid so, honey. Norman, how could you do this? Why did you do it? Well. Why? Oh. Well, I, I guess you might as well know, but because of the dream. What, the dream about me? Yes. What in heaven's name can the dream have to do with dream, knives? In the dream, you try to kill me with a knife. I try to kill you? With a carving knife. Exactly like the knives I took and threw away. Long, gleaming, razor sharp. Are you telling me... That I'm going to kill you? Stab you to death with a carving knife? Yes, that's, that's what I'm afraid of, Sandy. It's why I've been throwing away the knives, the carving knife that you somehow come up with again and again. You know something? You are out of your head. Just because that first prize is a carving knife is no reason... 
I'll get it. Monsieur Philippe. Uh, may I come in, Sandy? Uh, uh, yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, Monsieur Meredith. Hello. Uh, can I give you a drink? Oh, no, 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 merci, no. I stay only a minute or two. The fact of the matter is I am somewhat embarrassed to be here. Embarrassed? Something okay. has happened which I do not understand. Uh, uh, this morning, I presented you with a beautiful carving knife. First prize for your work in my cooking class. Yeah. Yes. Well, this afternoon, a man come to me. He had been fishing on the banks of the Seine, and his hook had caught on this. The knife. A carving knife. Uh, oui, Monsieur Meredith. The knife I gave you, Sandy, as first prize. It is, uh, shall I say, a puzzle to me, an embarrassment, because the knife could have got into the river only one way. It must have been thrown there, and, well, alors, what I'm trying to say is if you do not want the knife... Oh. No, hey, I... Monsieur Meredith, he, he has fainted. Yeah... Is it something with knives? When I gave it to you this morning, it turned white, looked sick. And now, do knives bother him? And so? <laughs> they... They what? They kill him, Monsieur Philippe. They kill him. <laughs> Well, all things considered, I think they'd kill me, too. It is curious, this affinity Sandra Lawrence has for carving knives. Or they for her. I'll return shortly with Act Three. dreams come true? Do they ever? If they do, is Norman Meredith fated to be stabbed to death by the woman who haunts his dreams? The woman he finds irresistible in real life? Sandy. Yes, Norman? Tell me where it is. Well, what is? You know what. The knife. Norman, we said we wouldn't talk about it anymore, remember? I remember you said we wouldn't. When I came into that hotel room in Paris and asked you what you'd done with the knife, you said we wouldn't talk about it anymore. Not me. I... I threw it away. You're a liar. Norman. You wouldn't have thrown it away. It meant too much to you. You've hidden it. All right, all right. I, I hid it. Get it. What, so you can throw it away? No. Listen to me. No, Norman, you listen to me for once. I'm listening. Now, the first time we met, I was... Well, not what I am now. I was kind of tough. I was kind of coarse. Kind of person I... I don't want to be anymore because you showed me another kind of life. Where is the knife? Listen to me, please. Norman, I'm trying real hard to be the kind of woman who'd, who'd be worthy of you, you know? The kind of woman you could really love. The kind of woman you, you'd marry. We'll talk about all this later. Right now, I want that knife. Norman, forget the Sandy, knife. Sandy, you get me that knife. Wherever you hit it, get it and give it to me or so help me out. All right. All right. Here. You want it? Take what? it. You... You threw it at me. Another inch and it would have... You wanted it, Norman. You got it. Pick it up. Ah, oh, pick it up. Well, pick it up, all right. I'll pick it up. I'll... That's the last you'll ever see of it. There's plenty of others. There's no trick buying a carving you'll knife. You'll buy no knives. I'm going to get rid of this, and it's the last carving knife we'll ever see in this house. We'll see about that. I'm telling Ma'am, you... Ma'am, I'm telling you... Nothing. You're telling me nothing. Norman! No! No! Nothing. <laughs> <sighs> Oh! Oh, what have I done? I don't understand. I killed her. I stabbed her to death. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So, 
Agnes, all I can say is you were right. From the first right, it was just an aberration or infatuation, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, it's over. Will you take me back? Of course, Norman. I never really let you go. But... Yes? Are you sure it's over? Done with it. Are you absolutely sure? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I left her this morning. I told her that uh, everything was over between us. Everything. What did she say? Nothing. She must have said something. Nothing. <laughs> Norman. Norman, darling. I'm sorry. No. Oh, you poor dear. You're worn out on the ragged edge. Done for. Through. No. Yes. No. Yes, I've, I've ruined our marriage. My business. Now, that's nonsense. Never, Our marriage is... Never, never be the same. You know it won't, Agnes. Oh, I did. Leaving you, running off with her. Well, you were caught up in something beyond your control. Too powerful for you to handle. But it, it's over now. Put it behind you. Begin again. I can't. I can't. But it isn't the end for us, Norman. It is for her. What? It is the end for her. You mean Sandra Lawrence? Well, yes, in a way I suppose it is, but her kind, she'll she'll get by. She'll start living again. Don't say that. But darling, she will. It isn't all over for her either. It is. It is. I killed her, Agnes. What kind of nonsense are you talking? Norman. Uh, Norman, we're not going to talk anymore. Not now. I, um... I've got to go out for an hour or two, but while I'm gone, I want you to rest. Now, lie down for a while. Will you do that? Yes. And, um, if you feel like a snack, ask Nora to fix something for you. Nora? Oh, I haven't had a chance to tell you. We have a maid. Nora. Wonderful cook, too. So, if you want something, just ask her. You'll find her in the kitchen. She loves it, so she practically hibernates there. What is it, dear? This isn't a dream, is it? That I'm home with you. I'm not dreaming, am I, Agnes? If you are, it's no nightmare, darling. Isn't it? Isn't it? I'm afraid I told a little lie, Arnold. I just said I had to go out for an hour or so, but... Of course, I came straight here to see you. I'm glad you did, Agnes. I'm as worried about Norman as you are. He talked about Sandra Lawrence as if he had killed her. I mean, really killed her. When, of course, what he meant was that he felt that he'd ended her happiness, ruined her future. Oh, excuse me, my nurse. Yes? Captain who? The police. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Put him through. Hey, yes, Captain. This is Dr. Gerstein. Yes? Well, she was a patient of mine. She... What's that? Stabbed to death? Oh, good heavens. I'd... Yes, yes, yes. Of course, I'll answer any questions you may have to... No, not at all. Goodbye. Agnes, you, uh, you said you left Norman at home? Yes. We'd better go there at once. Why? Arnold, what is it? And that was the police. Sandra Lawrence was found this afternoon in her apartment, stabbed to death. Oh. Norman was telling the truth. He did kill her. It seems likely, Agnes. All too likely. Norman? Norman? Oh, he's probably in the bedroom asleep. I'll come with you. No, it's empty. 
Uh, the, the kitchen. I told him if he wanted a snack to ask Nora. Nora, have you seen... Easy, easy, Agnes. And Norman on the floor, knife in his chest. Hang on to yourself. Norman's sitting at the kitchen table, blood all over it. Norman, dead. Stabbed to death. What oh, is this happening? Am I going out of my mind? Come with me. Norman. Please, Agnes, come with me. Arnold, Arnold. Now you just sit here in the living room and let me handle things out there. Nora, that is your name, isn't it, Nora? Yes. What happened here? I don't know. I can't make any sense out of it. What happened? He came here into the kitchen. I had just started dinner. He stared at me like I was some kind of ghost or something. And then he... He flung himself at me, grabbed me by the throat, and he was screaming, I'll kill you once and for all, I'll kill you and be rid of you. <laughs> I grabbed for something to protect myself with. And the carving knife was handy, I grabbed that. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, he was there on the floor with a knife in his chest. Dead. <laughs> I killed him. <laughs> I killed him. But he would have killed me if I had. <laughs> Why? Why would he have killed you? Agnes, go back into the living room. Leave this to me. I want to know. My husband didn't even know you, Nora. Why would he have wanted to kill you? I don't understand. I do. Or do I? What do you mean? When did you hire Nora? Yesterday. Yesterday morning. According to the police, that's about the time Sandra Lawrence was murdered. What of it? What in heaven's name has that to do with Nora? Look at her, Agnes. Take a good look. Tall, hazel eyes with flecks of green. Long, blonde hair. You never met her, but I can tell you, Nora is the image to the life of Sandra Lawrence. So, through one of those strange twists that fate so often takes, Norman Meredith's nightmare became reality, as he always knew it would. I'll be back shortly. As I said when we began, little, if anything, is known about the origin of dreams, where they come from, why they come, what they mean. I can only wish most sincerely for all your dreams to be happy ones, but I doubt that they will. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Terry Keene, Grace Matthews, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. Your mind, Clark. You gave me your ring. But, but I told you... Claude, you may play with other women. You may deceive other women. But no man in the history of the world has ever deceived me and lived. I am Venus. I am Aphrodite. But I only... Hundreds, thousands, numberless races of men on this planet have worshipped me under numberless names. And now, I choose you. You must... Leave this woman. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, 
pleasant dreams?